Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 16th meeting in 2014 of the Finance Committee of the Scottish Parliament. Could I please remind everyone present to please turn off any mobile phones or electronic devices? Uh, before moving to item one, I want to respond to some of the reports in the media last week regarding the written submission from Dr. Quartrup. Uh, members were notified by the clerks on Wednesday 7th of May that the submission did not address the issues which the committee is considering in relation to Scotland's public finances post-2014. Uh, Dr Kvortrup was given the option of providing a further submission which addressed the specific issues regarding public finances. However, given the initial submission is not relevant to the committee's current work, his appearance before us would not have added to the discussion. The Parliament's policy of written evidence states that normal practice is to publish all relevant evidence. On this basis, submission has not been published on the committee's web pages, but is available from the, par from the clerks. The committee, in my view, has worked on a very consensual and constructive basis this session. It is therefore deeply disappointing that any concerns were raised directly with the media, ran with me, the clerks, or indeed at the commencement of last week's committee first. Obviously, um, members are free to contact uh, the media uh, subsequently if they so wish, and indeed beforehand, but I, I think uh, 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 contacting the committee itself would have been more helpful. However, I hope we can continue to work together constructively and deliver the effective scrutiny, which I believe is a hallmark of the Finance Committee. So, moving on, our first and only item of business today is to take evidence on Scotland's public finances post-2014 from Professors David Simpson and Jeremy Peat. Members have received written submissions from both our witnesses, so we will go straight to questions from the committee. And uh, I'm sure our guests know how we operate here in the Finance Committee, but what will happen is I will ask uh, questions of the witnesses and then um, we will open out the session to colleagues uh, around the table. Now, I've asked a question to uh, Professor Simpson. Uh, once he responds, uh, um, Professor Pete can, of course, uh, add his comments subsequently and vice versa. So I want this to be something where I'm not specifically asking just to, uh, questions just to one individual. I want you both to feel that you can interact with each other and uh, it will make for a much more interesting session. We'll try not to keep you the three and a half hours we kept our first <laughs> panel session. Um, so, um, but I'm sure we'll have a very interesting um, uh, morning today. OK, so first of all, I think the first question I'll ask will be to Professor uh, Simpson. And uh, it's more or less the first paragraph of your submission, um, which is about um, uh, you see, about borrowing. And you say, uh, as, as an opening statement, that the UK government will assume legal liability for the whole of UK government debt following Scottish independence. Um, it should also assume moral or political responsibility, and that consequently, an independent Scottish government need not accept liability for a population share of that debt. And in fact, you go on to say that. Under the protective umbrella of the union, average living standards in Scotland have fallen. In each of the last five years, we have become poorer together. And if Scotland remains within the union, its citizens will continue to be saddled with a burden of government debt for decades to come. Now, I'm sure there are some members of the committee who will agree with that, others will disagree. But uh, if we look at it in practical terms, um, if uh, the Scottish Government, and I know that their intention is not to go down this line, but if they did decide to do that, what would be the impact on the ability of an independent Scottish Government to uh, borrow on the markets? Well, I would... I'm not a lawyer, but I would suppose that if you don't have a legal liability and uh, you don't pay, then that doesn't constitute a default. Um, I think, however, that the matter would be negotiable. Uh, I wouldn't expect the Scottish Government to pay nothing. I think, it, I think the official position has been declared as an equitable... Sh it will assume an equitable share of the UK government debt on independence. Now, the question is, what constitutes an equitable share? Now, I would argue that that's a very subjective judgment and not quantifiable. But my paper is really designed to say why I think Scottish negotiators would, should take a fairly hard line on the question of what the size of this equitable share might be. OK, but, um, I mean, how do you think... Uh, I mean, given the fact that the Scottish Government is, is looking to have an amicable relationship with the UK over things such as, for example, a, a, a possible currency union, etc., th this kind of hard line you're talking about, do you think that it's actually uh, feasible in terms of how it could be delivered? Do you think that that's something that uh, the other side of the argument would be even willing to countenance? I, 
I'm not quite sure that I followed. I'm sorry, I'm slightly hard of hearing. I couldn't quite follow the last couple of sentences of what you said. Oh, sorry, I apologise. No, uh, no, it's uh, my fault. If, <laughs> if, the, if the UK government, act, uh, would the UK government be willing to negotiate with a Scottish government based on this kind of hard line that you're actually talking about? Does it, does it not need a situation whereby both sides are willing to compromise even at the outset? if we're going to have a, a kind of amicable arrangement which includes issues such as potentially currency sharing? Absolutely agree. I think there has to be, there will eventually be an amicable outcome, but I think that that doesn't mean to say that you start from a position in which you give up everything that you would like to have. Um, Jeremy. Um, Good morning, Karina. Um, by way of background, let me say that I think that uh, we can all agree that Scotland and the rest of the UK would be far better off if we had made better use of the oil and gas revenue resources in the initial period uh, and had, had built up a fund in, in the way at least one other Scandinavian country did. And I was fascinated in reading the evidence of your last session that Gavin McCrone has a yet-to-be-revealed paper in which uh, he did recommend the establishment of a fund at the time. Um, so, yes, we'd be much better off if that fund had established. Yes, we'd be much better off if uh, we hadn't built up the public and private debt during the period uh, leading up to and following the, the recession. Um, and therefore, it is a concern for all involved that the level of debt has reached where it is. However... I very much agree with the gist of your first point, which is that I do believe that the markets would take a pretty dim view of Scotland um, seeking to uh, reduce its liability for the debt substantially as part of the negotiations. The UK has the credit rating it has because it's never defaulted, never come close to default. And I think Scotland, as a newly independent nation, would have to establish its own credit rating. Uh, it would start with potentially a somewhat higher cost of borrowing, as Angus Armstrong and others have demonstrated, than is the case at the present, and it would be wishing to uh, achieve credibility so that the cost of borrowing came back towards the UK level as rapidly as possible. Being seen to default or wishing to default, and that I think is what it would be deemed by the markets, would put that passage towards lower borrowing costs at risk, and therefore I think it, it would be counterproductive. I also agree that there's going to be a very difficult negotiation over a currency union, as, and as I've stated in my paper, I do believe that the currency union is the best option for Scotland and potentially the best for the rest of the UK. And I would far prefer to see effort put into achieving that end, uh, even if it does involve accepting uh, an appropriate share, whatever that may be, of the debt, and appropriate re arrangements to reimburse Her Majesty's Government for the, uh, the borrowing that they have agreed to take responsibility for in the first instance. Why would uh, the markets consider Scotland as defaulted if, in fact, the Treasury has a, a legally accepted responsibility for the debt, which, of course, it has run up over these many decades, most recently in, and uh, most of it in recent years, in fact? Well, my understanding is that uh, the Treasury has taken legal responsibility for the debt in the sense that it will be uh, the party that repays to the markets as and when debt becomes due. But that is on the expectation and the firm understanding that they would in turn be reimbursed by Scotland in the event of Scottish independence on a basis agreed between the two countries. Uh, so that Scotland was meeting a proportionate share of the cost of servicing that debt, which would then be passed to the Treasury, even if the Treasury had legal responsibility in the first instance. OK. Of course you can. Um, I agree that if it were the case that the negotiations ended in a disharmony and disagreement, <coughs> there might be a... Uh, there might be a view taken uh, that, in some sense, Scotland had not played fair with the rest of the UK. And that might have or might not have some impact on market sentiment. <clears throat> Excuse me, however, but what you have to understand is that the question of the Scottish share of the UK debt 
is just one in many elements in the whole negotiating uh, part, if you like. And if I can give you the example of Ireland, when Ireland left in 1922, it negotiated away in its entire share of the UK national debt in exchange for moving the border uh, further away from Belfast. So it's all negotiable. That's the point that has to be made. But when you start a negotiation, you start by trying to make as strong arguments as you can, and not by starting by saying, OK, you know, we'll give you everything you want. OK. Uh, of course, uh, one or two of our witnesses said that the Scottish government's 8.4% uh, you know, population share, for example, might be too modest and that uh, because Scotland's got a greater GDP per head, we should contribute a higher share within our population. I take it that's something you think should be uh, completely discounted. Well, as I said, these uh, things are, once you recognise that it's a moral or political claim rather than a legal claim, then you recognise that these things are subjective and different people will hold different views. And that's how things... That's how you get to a negotiating situation. I mean, my view on that last point is that the question of whether it be a population share or a GDP-related share is very much a matter of negotiation and discussion. That would come out as part of the overall process. But I would repeat that uh, what matters is the perception of the markets rather than the actual firm legal um, position. And if the markets perceive that Scotland is not acting appropriately with regard to taking on a fair and reasonable share of debt. That is what will influence their thinking, rather than going to the fine detail of what the precise legal position is. OK. Now, Jim, I'm going to switch to your paper just now, uh, and um, I'll jump between the two, actually, as we go along, depending on the subjects and my particular whim of the moment. But uh, I'm going to ask about currency union, Jeremy. Um, uh, and you say... In your paper, uh, whether conditions under which a continuing currency union might be agreed uh, permitted sufficient sec flexibility to Scotland on the fiscal and monetary fronts to develop our own priorities and policies. Um, do, do you think that a currency union would give Scotland more or less uh, flexibility uh, in these areas than it has at the moment? I think it would probably be roughly the same. Uh, I think what one would find uh, is that uh, if there were to be agreement on a currency union, then there would be a requirement, whether this was 100% necessary and appropriate in strict economic and financial terms, there would be a requirement for monetary policy to remain the province of the Monetary Policy Committee, looking primarily, if not exclusively, at the interests of the rest of the UK, and at the same time that there would be fiscal constraints imposed upon Scotland, which would be tight and binding so far as the overall balance between expenditure and revenue is concerned. That, I think, would be inevitably part of the package. Whether it goes beyond that to introduce constraints on individual elements of fiscal policy, I think, is significantly more uncertain. But I would doubt that they would permit uh, changes, for example, in uh, corporation tax, which would be deemed to advantage Scotland over all or parts of the remainder of the UK. I think it's going to be a tough enough process to agree a currency union, given what has been stated politically uh, thus far, as it is. And I think that the great conundrum is that while this would be preferable for Scotland to have that stable and fixed exchange rate continuing, uh, and it would enable a stable story in which the early days of independence could take place, that might come at the price of yielding up flexibility on monetary and fiscal policy and potentially on some particular fiscal instruments, which might be uh, difficult for a new Scottish government to accept. So as ever with these things, there will be trade-offs to make with the advantage of the stability and the continuing exchange rate security uh, be acceptable as a trade-off against the um, loss of flexibility that could have been achieved in the event of an independent Scottish currency. That's the type of discussion that would have to take place. Well, there are 17 countries <clears throat> in the Eurozone at present. I mean, do they? none of them have those kind of tight levels of fiscal rules that you're kind of talking about. So why would there be such a, a tight 
control between Scotland and the rest of the UK relative to, for example, the Eurozone? Well, uh, the first of all, the Eurozone, of course, there is one uh, interest rate uh, and one monetary policy, and there are increasingly tight fiscal uh, rules at the aggregate level that are in place, and there are constraints on individual countries, uh, and Ireland's been mentioned already, there are concerns about the corporation tax rate in, in Ireland and whether that is going to be acceptable to the European Union going forward. So the same debate has taken place in the European Union about uh, rigidity of fiscal policies in aggregate terms and the extent of flexibility that would be permitted to individual member states so far as individual regimes are concerned. So I think the same process and the same debate applies. But I would just argue that uh, it's going to take quite an effort to encourage the political parties at Westminster to actually agree to negotiate on the currency union, and I think they would require fairly significant concessions on the part of the Scottish Government to achieve that end. David, uh, the only effort that's required to persuade the parties at Westminster is to, have, is to have a yes vote in September, because the salient point about the currency union is that in the event of a yes vote, that will be uh, the best option for the rest of the UK. And that is why that uh, cabinet minister, who is apparently uh, anonymous, but I think we all know his name, said, of course, there would be a currency union, not because it's in Scotland's interest, but because it's in the interest of the rest of the UK, because the Scottish market is, uh, I think I'm right in saying, the second largest market for the rest of the UK, after the United States. So... It's purely hard-headed reasons will make the currency union the preferred option in the event of a yes vote. Now, as to the restraints on uh, our overall monetary and fiscal policy, yes, Jeremy's quite right, but what he forgot to mention is that these restraints would be reciprocal, that they would apply yeah. equally to England and the rest of the UK. Now, that might seem like something tough for them to swallow, but in the uh, climate that we're entering into, in which I hint at in my paper of debt being a, a perennial specter at the feast, I think that a number of far-seeing politicians would actually welcome constraints on fiscal policy because it gives them cover uh, against uh, the clamour of those in their own party who would wish for extravagant spending to be continued. But Jeremy, you could go on in your paper in the next paragraph to the one I quoted from to say that uh, a move would appear necessary by Scotland to either enter the Eurozone or establish a new and distinct Scottish currency. Uh, so you're kind of arguing for a currency union for stability, but then you're saying that it, almost inevitably uh, we would move on from that position. Do you not think there's a lot of assumptions being made there? Certainly are a lot of assumptions being made, I agree. Uh, and let me say I, I agree with David that... Uh, uh, almost certainly the continuing currency union, and it is a continuing currency union, we're in a currency union now, would be uh, the best outcome for the rest of the UK as well as Scotland, but unfortunately hard-headed logic doesn't always apply in political discussions. Um, but uh, what I'm simply saying is that if after a period of independence the severe constraints on fiscal policy uh, and the constraints on monetary policy were deemed unacceptable, then there would have to be a move to an alternative. Now, why would that happen? One possibility of that happening would be that the economies diverged, that Scottish Government introduced a variety of different policies which took it in a different direction from the rest of the UK, uh, that the position on oil and gas revenues uh, makes Scotland susceptible to different forces than the UK, or the remainder of the UK, and it could be that the monetary policy becomes increasingly inappropriate and the issues on fiscal policy become different for Scotland uh, than they are seen uh, while being part of a currency union. So under those circumstances, it may be that the Scottish Government would wish to uncouple itself from the currency union in order to allow the development of monetary and fiscal policies specific to Scotland, which, which were seen in the best interest of Scotland as an independent nation. And at that stage, they might be ready to move either to uh, its own currency or to consider, if circumstances have changed in Europe, a move to a Eurozone. So, yes, a whole host of assumptions. I'm just trying to think forward 
to whether a currency union, if achieved, will be something acceptable to a Scottish government on a long-term basis. And I suspect there may be circumstances in which it would not be acceptable on a long-term basis. And you've kind of ruled out sterilisation, of course, which uh, Jo Armstrong touched on. And she was giving evidence. What, 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 can you just give us some further detail as to why you're against that? You talk about stability being one of the reasons. Well, I, I, I'm not the greatest expert on sterilisation or on a currency board. But from what I have read and from speaking to people in different parts of the financial sector and elsewhere, I just don't believe it would be seen as a stable and continuing position for a country as substantial as Scotland. Uh, and I think there would be risks that the Scottish financial sector would see that the currency relationship was uncertain, there were risks of changes, mm -hmm. they might wish to relocate some of their activities into um, the rest of the UK, given that for many of these companies they sell many more products in the rest of the UK than they do in Scotland. The markets might not be convinced that this was stable and they might charge a premium on interest rates. So I just find it unlikely to be uh, uh, a valid option. John Kay appears to change his, have changed his mind on this, but uh, I do believe that this is less than likely to be a viable option. And in, in practice, the stark choice will be between a currency union and an independent currency. David? <coughs> David? Um, I don't think I, at this stage, I want to add uh, anything to what Jeremy said. I think, uh, you know, it's fine. Okay. Um, let's go back to debt a wee minute. It's just about uh, the issue of quantitative easing. Um, um, uh, Dr. Jim Cuthbert talked at some length about uh, quantitative easing and the role it plays in terms of debt. We already had a, a kind of brief discussion about, uh, you know, Scotland's share of debt, what it might be post-independence, if indeed Scotland votes for independence. But um, should the, 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 the £375 billion pounds that's been put into the UK economy through quantitative easing be included in that figure? Because uh, Dr Cuthbert argued that it's not real debt and if it, you know, there's no interest paid by the Treasury, for example, because it's effectively s circulating um, within its own system. So what's your view on that? Should uh, any de get debt negotiations include or exclude um, quantitative easing? But if I can first go on that. Sure, I, huh? I, I mean, I read uh, Jim's work with considerable interest and uh, it was a novel argument to me, but one I found very powerful. Uh, if the quantitative easing funds are not costing to service and if it ended up with them being effectively written off, then there is no cost to that debt to the UK government and I don't see that that would justify any cost to a Scottish government post-independence. So if those QE funds are just sitting there and not being, there's no interest falling due and if in due course they are written off as part of the process uh, in years to come, then I quite agree with Jim that it's wholly inappropriate for them to be included and for Scotland to be paying a cost for servicing debt that no one else is paying for. Okay. David? I don't think I need to add anything once more to what Jeremy <laughs> said. It's good to have some consensus, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if, it'll, uh, if it, will, uh, it will continue. Just one last point before I open up to colleagues uh, around the table, and it's yourself, uh, David, on this occasion. I mean, you talk about the... Um, you know, the, the kind of recession that we've gone through not being a global recession but effectively being made in uh, London and uh, Washington uh, effectively by the governments of Blair Brown and uh, Bush. Um, Sheena, you've said, and I quote, the financial crisis that began in that year was neither external nor global, re referring to 2007. Um, our discussions about uh, finances post-2014 are not just about what happens if Scotland becomes independent. Um, what concerns do you have if, in fact, Scotland remains within the Union with regard to the public finances? Sorry, I didn't catch the last sentence. It was just what concerns do you have about the state of the public finances if Scotland remains in the Union? <clears throat> I see, yes. Well, uh, the answer is that I, my concerns are more or less expressed in the body of the paper, because then uh, we, would, uh, we would be in the same boat as the rest of the UK, which at the moment is looking to me as if it's heading for some very 
rough weather indeed, because in addition to the uh, published explicit debt, there are all these other liabilities which are not taken account of in the published accounts, which include things like uh, state pension obligations, the uh, public sector worker pension obligations, the increases in future health care spending, and indeed increases in all government spending which would, would exceed those that can be paid for by revenues raised under the current tax regime. And as I said, the, I've quoted uh, research by an American economist who puts these numbers very much higher, five times higher than the accumulated past debt. Now, even if we only take that's only a very rough estimate, it still gives us cause for concern. And what it means in practical terms is that um, I think uh, that even when the present planned increases in taxation and cuts in public expenditure, which are laid out between here and 2018, uh, are completed, I think we shall find still further the need to either increase taxes or cut public expenditure or both simply in order to keep uh, government debt within limits that are acceptable to financial markets. I think David's paper and this question that you've raised and he's responded to just underscores the importance of looking at various scenarios for the long-term outlook for the public finances. At one of your sessions, you discussed the IFS figures um, and witnesses and members uh, reinforced the point that these were projections rather than forecasts. Uh, but I think it is very important that we do look longer term at what could be the story over a period beyond five years, looking at what's going to happen to expenditure given health issues, given demographic issues, and what's likely to happen under various scenarios to finances, to get a view of the long-term health of the public finances. And that is one of the roles of the OBR at the moment at the UK level, is to produce that longer-term forecast, and the IFS also takes this on. And I think in Scotland that would be as important, if not more important, than in the UK as a whole. Because in, a, in an independent Scotland there are issues about demography which need to be examined. There are issues about an ageing population and the story on health. There are issues about what's going to happen on the tax side, given various stories about what happens on North Sea oil and gas. There are so many uncertainties and different paths that could be taken in the longer term that just examining these and looking at potential implications enables the government uh, to get a feel of where of what the risks are and the uncertainties are, and therefore to plan the public finances, not just looking at a two, three-year period, but taking account of those longer-term elements. And I think that is critical, uh, and it is important that some of that be done by independent bodies rather than wholly within the administration. Do you believe that there are risks and uncertainties regardless of the outcome of the referendum in terms of public finance? Of course there are. I mean, they're, they're, absolutely. I mean, uh, but uh, I think if one has an independent country, then the public finances uh, are a matter that will be of even more importance, both for the management of the economy and for the development of economic policies and within the relationship with the markets that is the case for Scotland as now. I'm not doubting that these, that I'm not saying the risks and uncertainties dramatically increase, I'm just saying the importance of understanding them and looking at them is enhanced. Uh, and I think that, uh, especially if the Scottish government, as would no doubt would be the case, wishes to change a number of policies, uh, and in order to understand how changes in those policies could play out in a longer term context. I think would be important to help policy formation and to make decision making as sound as it can be. Um, I'm going to open out the session now to colleagues around the table and the first person to ask questions will be Malcolm to be followed by Jamie. I mainly want to ask about debt but uh, since uh, Jeremy Peets raised the currency question can, can I just have one question 
about that. I mean, I know that both of you say it's the best option for the rest of the UK, although you'll know that Ted, distinguished economists who preceded you at this committee, took a different view, and of course, as all the UK parties take a different view. And in a kind of way, Jeremy Peat gave some of the objections that um, we know from the, the famous, if not notorious, note of Sir Nicholas Macpherson he was concerned about in terms of not being something that would last. You raised that possibility, uh, Jeremy. And also in terms of the terms would be unacceptable to the Scottish Government. So uh, shall we say uh, um, uh, that there is certainly not unanimity around the views you've expressed. But I suppose I'd be interested in more of your view about um, the terms that might be demanded. But also I'm interested in your saying it's in the interest of the rest of the UK because of transaction costs. But surely if that was the case, the UK would be banging at the door of the euro, which we know is the exact opposite of what they intend. So transaction costs are clearly not the only or even the overriding issue here for the UK government. Uh, that's certainly the case, and, and I don't disagree with any of the comments you made. Uh, they enhance the difficulty of the discussion. But I think that for the rest of the UK, and the National Institute have, have looked at this in their latest paper, I think the, the advantage are of con continuity of the relationship are very important. It matters more to Scotland because a higher percentage of Scotland's trade and business relationships are with the rest of the UK than is the converse. So it matters more to Scotland uh, than it does the rest of the UK. But for the rest of the UK, uh, as the convener has stated, Scotland is the UK's second largest market. There are so many companies which span the borders and operate across the two that continuity of the exchange rate relationship and removal of any risk of transaction costs, of any questions of VAT being payable, payable for cross-border trade if certain conditions apply. All of that makes it much more comfortable and much more straightforward for the rest of the UK to continue in the currency union than for an independent currency with all the currency risks and uncertainties and the costs to, to prevail. Um, as to why uh, this applies uh, to the UK currency union but not to the UK joining the Eurozone, well, we're talking about the status quo at the moment. We're talking about the position that is the case with, with the rest of the UK and Scotland and the currency union. Um, moving to uh, a Eurozone would mean the UK gave up independence of monetary policy, would mean that the exchange rate moved as was appropriate for the whole of the zone rather than just for the UK, and would mean moving into uh, circumstances where the stability and security of the Eurozone was, was uncertain. So uh, I don't think the same arguments have the same weight in the context of whether the UK might enter the Eurozone as in the case of the benefits that would apply to the rest of the UK for a stable relationship as part of a currency union with Scotland. I would just like to once again, I'm sorry to embarrass or disappoint you, agree with uh, everything Jeremy said. Uh, just an answer to the specific uh, point, the question, yes, I think there would be a, a gain in, trans, or rather a reduction in transaction costs on trade between the UK and the EU and the rest of the EU if, or the rest of the Eurozone, if the UK were to join the Euro. But these benefits are outweighed by the kind of factors that Jeremy, Jeremy alluded to. Whereas the the whole point about the idea of a European uh, of a UK currency union, which is a rather unfortunate term in my view, because it implies something new. Whereas the whole point about it is continuation of what's happening now. In other words, business as usual. That's the main reason for wishing to have a currency union. It just formalizes what the status quo really. Move on to um, debt. I mean, I think in a kind of way this is a bit academic because if, if the Scottish government refused to take, have anything to do with the debt, as Jeremy Peat said, I think that would have rather a devastating effect on interest rates. But let's take uh, David Simpson's paper in the terms that he puts it, that there is no moral case for Scotland taking on the, any responsibility for the debt. I, I did find this rather uh, an astonishing view because... Well, let's put it this way. Do you not think Scotland has benefited in any way 
uh, from um, the spending that has come from the UK government. I agree it would have been better to have an oil fund in the 1970s, but you know that, that's history now. Is it not the case in more recent times that Scotland has benefited? Let's just give two examples. This, this parliament benefited enormously in the early years from the, the public expenditure of the Labour government that you deplore. And more recently, of course, the Scottish banks were bailed out. And in fact, the biggest increase in the deficit was in order to bail out the bank. So surely Scotland has benefited from that. And in that sense, that undermines your point that we have no uh, uh, moral res responsibility uh, in relation to the debt. I, I hope I didn't give the impression that I said we had no moral responsibility for any of the debt. If I said that, I, I do apologize. I think I said, I hope I said, we have no responsibility, we do, shouldn't accept a moral responsibility for our per capita share of the debt. In other words, I think that we should uh, uh, bear, bear, that would be the starting point of the uh, our UK negotiators in, any, in the negotiations. And I don't think that we should start by accepting that. I think we should say, as, well, the Scottish government has gone so far as to say would accept an equitable share. And I'm just saying that we ought to be careful about agreeing what that equitable share should be and that in our negotiations we should be very clear about some of the reasons why we might not wish to accept a per capita share. Do you want to comment on that, Jeremy? Or? I personally believe that it is effectively inevitable that Scotland would find itself responsible for servicing some of the debt that the Treasury has taken responsibility for and the extent of debt that it was responsible be part of the negotiating process. Uh, I don't think the pure economics would be the only factor. Uh, I suspect that uh, the discussions uh, would be as much political as part of an overall bargaining process as anything else. Thank you. And of course, earlier in your paper, you um you go into the history of how the debt was accrued. I mean, none of us want to have too much debt, although I, I believe in historical terms it's not necessarily such a, an alarming figure. I, I noticed, look, well, I actually had figures going back for about 150 years, but, for example, in 1932 it was 177 per cent of GDP. Uh, and I suppose in relation to that, is it not the overall level of debt that matters? And was there not? I and mean, you, you make a particular point, so I have to respond to this of attacking the Labour government. Was the level of debt in 2007 before the banking crisis not, in fact, lower as a percentage of GDP than it, than it had been 10 years previously? It might well have been, but uh, the point was that having... Uh, accumulate, having had a period of growth that ended in 2007, one would have expected the, um, the budget deficit to be much lower than it actually was. In other words, there's a structural... We moved from a position in 2000 of having a, a structural budget surplus to a, a position in 2007 of having a structural budget deficit. And that, I think, was the period in which the public finances were really mismanaged. Well, I mean, I think, um, I don't know whether you had that view at the time, certainly no other political parties, either in this parliament or the other parliament, had the view at that time, because, of course, um, there were rules being followed. It was mainly the build-up of capital expenditure, which I think was three times greater investment expenditure in 2007 than 1997, and there was very little of a, a current budget uh, deficit. And, and do you not think, and again, looking to this parliament, that in fact there was a great need to have an expansion of public uh, expenditure at that time because of the, the state of the health service and some other public services? Well, in retrospect, yes, one could certainly argue on grounds of need that these expenditures were desirable. The question is, were they affordable? And the uh, answer is that they would have been affordable if the UK economy had continued to grow after 2007 at the rate at which it had grown from 2000 to 2007. But uh, as we all know, it didn't. And uh, the, mes the lesson of this is that we, we cannot uh, just uh, make the optimistic assumption 
that growth will always be there to provide the revenues that we need to pay for uh, the increasing costs of our public services. Want to comment on that? Then? Well, well I, I, I do agree with that last comment. I think that if one goes back to 2007, the assumption and expectation at that stage was that we had secured an environment in which growth around the trend would continue uh, virtually indefinitely, that we'd manage the monetary and fiscal policies of our economy in such a way that stability was ensured, 3% growth would continue, that would mean that a, a structural deficit of that order of magnitude was manageable, uh, but unfortunately we, um, we, we were complacent. Uh, we didn't allow for the huge build-up of private debt that took place, uh, which, uh, along with the banking crisis, led to such a rapid and deep deterioration in our economy that the public finances, which in retrospect were slightly loose at the time, became uh, severely damaged and one went into the, the deep and dark days that we all know about. So it was the combination of maybe marginally loose at that period, uh, along with the, the, the deepest recession in, in economic history in the UK that led to the outturn where debt and annual deficit levels were at wholly unacceptable uh, rates. Uh, it's, the history is there, and with the benefit of 100% hindsight, one would say, yes, there should have been a lower structural deficit. If you want those public expenditures uh, for good reasons, then you have to tighten by raising tax revenue in different areas. Yes, you should have constrained the housing boom. Yes, you should have constrained credit card borrowing and, and household debt increases in one means or another, possibly with tighter monetary policy. Uh, we were allowing the, the boom to develop and the bust inevitably followed. That, with the benefit of hindsight, one could see all that went wrong. Um, and it's easy to look um, back now and see what went wrong. But at the time, we believed that uh, We'd cracked it. We knew how to run the economy and always going to be sweetness and light for the indefinite future. Sadly, that's wrong. And it just, for me, that reinforces the view that you always need to look at the risks and uncertainties. You never assume everything is secure and stable. You have to look at downsides as well as upsides. And you have to take account of that in policy making. But, but when you say we, you would accept it wasn't just the politicians, but the economists, that nobody really saw what was, what was coming down the track. And would you also accept that the, the largest contribution to the de deficit was the banking crisis? Uh, and you know, in that sense, I feel that your paper is slightly unbalanced. Well, first of all, I want to say that I uh, personally didn't see uh, the crisis forthcoming. It was part coming partly because I wasn't looking. It's not my, it was not then and isn't really now my area of specialism. However, I want to say in fairness to those people who did see it coming and did, and, and did say so at the time that they need to be mentioned. One of them was uh, the Bank for International Settlements in Geneva, which is a little regarded bank, which is a sort of central bank or central bank, who uh, continuously sounded the warning there was warnings also from the European Central Bank, and there was warnings from our friend Vince Cable, who asked a very pointed question in the House of Commons, which I can send to you if you want, and we received a, a brush off. So there were, there were a few people who, whose eyes were on these affairs who were concerned about the unsustainability of the housing boom in the period up to 2007. And I don't feel that we, I don't agree with the idea that somehow these events are things that just come out of the blue like meteorites from outer space. I think it is very clear that these events have got uh, traceable causes and these causes are uh, misapprehension about the nature of economic activity and the nature of uh, the effects of monetary policy. In particular, that phrase which is often was then often repeated, no return to boom and bust. Now, that in turn gave rise, as I've said in my paper, to um, an under-provision within the Treasury for the 
uh, possibility of a recession and with the consequences that made things worse. But the recession itself did not come from outer space. It was man-made. It was made in Whitehall and as well as in the city of London. It was made on Washington as well as on Wall Street. And this has now subsequently been extremely well documented. And anybody who thinks that we live in a world in which there'll be no return to boom and bust has simply never read the most elementary books of economic history, which show very clearly that a cycle of boom and bust has been a feature of capitalism since at least the middle of the 19th century. Um, thank you. Uh, Jamie, to be followed by Michael. <coughs> thank you, uh, convener. Professor uh, Simpson, I want to uh, focus at your paper. Uh, first of all, and, uh, the convener highlighted this uh, part of it as well. You write, under the protective umbrella of the Union, average living standards in Scotland have fallen each of the past five years. We've become poorer together. I suppose that begets the question, how much uh, poorer? And you go on, you say, if Scotland remains within the Union, then its citizens will continue to be saddled with a burden of government debt for decades to come. So in the context of a, a no vote in September, is it your perspective we're likely to continue being poorer together? Well, um, we, we, we touched on this a, a couple of questions ago. Uh, I think the outlook for the UK as a whole is uh, fairly rough over the next uh, several years. Uh, whether that will return, whether that will be reflected in absolute decline in living standards, I would hesitate to say, because the one thing I do feel confident about is, I think Jeremy shares the same view, is that economists have no special view of the future, have no insight into what will happen next year. Nobody, if somebody tells you what the uh, level of the stock market will be one year from now, do not believe them. They do not know. And economists equally cannot predict what the levels of interest rates are going to be in one year's time, let alone two, three, four, five. So we cannot foresee the future. However, all I would say is that um, from what we do know about economic activity, um, the prospects are for um, a much uh, tougher period over the next five to ten years than we have perhaps been accustomed to enjoying uh, up to 2007. If, first of all, the, this question of uncertainty and difficulty of forecasting it is absolutely right. I, one of my favourite sayings from, I think it was Eddie George, was there are two types of economists, those who don't know and those who don't know that they don't know. Uh, and I've, those that don't know that they don't know are very dangerous animals. So if anyone comes to you and says they have absolute certainty this is going to happen, they can explain with detailed econometric equations why. I uh, uh, don't believe them. They don't know. We can all hypothesize. We can all talk about different things that could happen. We, could try to un we can try and understand what's going on and how that feeds into the process, but no one has absolute certainty. Um, returning to the question of uh, the, the decline in living standards, uh, it has been an extended period where GDP has fallen. We may this year get back to the level of GDP pre-recession. We won't get back to the level of GDP per head in the UK for some time longer, because the population uh, has grown considerably over that period. And so GDP per head will still be below uh, where it was pre-recessions. Uh, David says in his paper that uh, average wages uh, might get back to pre-recession level in perhaps 2019. Uh, certainly we have not seen real wages moving upwards until just now, maybe for the last month or so, there's been some increase. It's been a very, very tough period. Uh, and we are now growing... Uh, at a much stronger rate than we have been for a number of years. Whether that is sustainable depends on the view you take as to whether it is balanced or whether it is over-dependent upon consumption, funded by a combination of positive views uh, about the housing market and uh, payments from banks for their excesses in, in lending in different ways. Uh, 
I, I'm not convinced we're 100% sustainable yet. I worry that uh, we haven't got the growth in investment, business, uh, corporate investment. We haven't got uh, the manufacturing sector, the exporting sector back to where we would wish it. We have a way to go before we've got the type of balanced growth that we can relax a little on. So, yes, I hope that um, we'll get back to the level of GDP per head next year or wherever. Yes, I hope we'll get gentle increases in average earning rates over the next few years. But personally, I, my view is whether Scotland is an independent nation or part of the UK, this will be a very tough five years ahead, and one which is going to require very tight policies uh, in order to progress towards a more stable and sustainable environment. But even when we get there, given the lessons of the past, we have to continue to watch out for risks, continue to watch out for unexpected and undesirable events, and continue to be very conservative with a small c in the way we deal with economic policies and public finances. Professor Simpson, in your paper you also talk a little about revenues from Scottish waters of the North Sea, which I'll turn to in a minute, but I thought it was interesting Jenny repeat talking about how it would have been much better if we used oil and gas better in the early years, and uh, you referred to uh, Gavin Macron's uh, report that he revealed to us uh, here at, at this committee. We now know he prepared that in advance of uh, the cabinet, the UK cabinet that Jim Cuthbert referred to when he, he was here of 15th of December 1977, uh, where uh, the cabinet <coughs> minutes of, of that meeting state, above all, the creation of an oil fund would play into the hands of the Scottish nationalists for whom it would become a major political target and uh, Jim Cuthbert's perspective is that, that this is explicitly why we did not get an oil fund which you can perhaps comment on in a minute but in your paper Professor Simpson you say despite oil tax revenues from the Scottish waters of the North Sea having contributed some £160 billion to the UK exchequer since 1980 every family in Scotland has ended up with a debt of some £50,000 uh, and you contrast it with Norway which has a sovereign wealth fund that in 2012 was worth some £450 billion or about £200,000 for each Norwegian family. Uh, to me, that uh, leads to the obvious question, you know, what lessons do we draw uh, from these experiences for the future? Um, did you want me to uh, say any more on that? <laughs> well, in indeed, I mean, the, the, the question is, given that this has been our historic experience, and of course this is history, there's nothing yes. we can do about that, that has happened, yes. but surely we can draw lessons from that experience for the future. Well, I hope so. I mean, I, I, re I agree with Jeremy that the future is, the next five years is going to be exceptionally tight under whatever uh, arrangements of governance we have. However, I would hope that uh, these would not be so tight as to not leave room for at least the beginning of the establishment of some sort of oil fund. Uh, I think it's significant that I, of all the countries that have had oil as a significant part of their wealth, only the UK and Iraq have failed to establish an oil fund. So I would hope that uh, it would be an early priority of a Scottish government uh, to do that. If I can make a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, I, I entirely agree that it would have been desirable to establish an oil fund uh, at the time that North Sea oil and gas revenues were booming. This would have been a far better approach and we as a nation, UK and Scotland, have um, suffered relatively from the failure to take that step and it is uh, I, I'm not aware of the exact circumstances in which the Cabinet decided, but um, I heard what you said with interest. Um, but I would note that over recent years, Scotland has achieved a higher level of public expenditure per head than is the average across the UK as a whole, while the level of non-oil and gas tax revenues has been roughly the same as uh, at the UK level. So whether that higher level of public expenditure per head has in part been um, in compensation for the lack of an oil fund, whether it could be justified on a needs assessment basis, 
I am not sure, and until we have a full needs assessment, retrospective study, we will never know. But one has to remember that Scotland has enjoyed a higher level of public expenditure per head during this period. Um, looking forward, um, I think that the best time for an oil fund is in the past rather than the future. Um, I personally would like us to explore a possibility whereby one planned the public finances in Scotland on the basis of a reasonable uh, central expectation for oil and gas revenues, uh, preferably agreed with uh, external non-partisan parties, that then if there are any, uh, if the actual level of oil and gas receipts exceeds that reasonable level, then that could go into an oil fund. If the receipts go below the expectation, then the government would have to compensate elsewhere in its tax or uh, expenditure plans in order to manage through. So that slightly unbalanced approach to managing the public finances uh, as oil and gas revenues vary com against expectations would allow an oil fund to be begin to be built up. And if one had uh, very strong revenues, uh, as some in the Scottish Government believe is anticipated, then I would rather that those above most people's expectation revenue streams go into a fund rather than being treated as part of the standard public finances. So that would be my approach. Get a reasonable central expectation, run your budget on that basis, anything below that level, cope, anything above that level, put it into a fund and use it to build for capital and other expenditure in uh, the years ahead. Would, would one lesson we could draw from that experience that we shouldn't rely on a political class where uh, they have had a recommendation from one of their own senior economic advisors to establish such an oil fund uh, that discounts it on a political basis rather than a practical basis. We shouldn't rely on that uh, class to make such decisions for us. Could that not be one lesson we draw from that experience? Well, one lesson I would draw from that experience is that transparency is of great value in aiding good decision-making and holding those making decisions to account. So if there had been more transparency, not necessarily from the senior civil servant, but from an external body looking at the issues rationally and uh, from a, a position of sound analysis uh, and on an evidence-based basis, then having that in the public domain and judging decisions by government against the backcloth of that information analysis would, in my view, uh, provide some constraint on decision making and also help the public to understand and to consider whether they supported decisions that were being taken by governments. Mr. Chairman, can I just comment on Jeremy's uh, citation of the higher public expenditure figures in Scotland over a number of years? And these are frequently referred to. However, as everyone must be aware, um, public expenditure on anything, whether it's in the public or the private sector, is merely a measure of inputs. What we really need is a measure of outturns or outcomes. And I think it's fair to say that over the last 10 years or so, in the public sector, there's been much more attention, has moved to outcomes, whether it be in health or in education or in other areas, despite the obvious huge difficulty of measuring these things. But at least we're trying to measure the right things. And until we do that, I'm not at all impressed by measures of input because we don't know how much of that input resulted in good outcomes and how much was simply wasted. Just, I just don't know. Just to add to that, uh, I mean, I, I had a very valuable and informative discussion with this committee last autumn, I believe it was, on the National Performance Framework when I came in my days at the Dave Hume Institute with a group. And I think the MPF is, is a wonderful creation. And I think more emphasis on exactly what you've described, David, on determining what are the desired outcomes for a Scottish government and measuring the extent to which they're being achieved across a variety of activities is very important. And I think the MPF is something that Scotland should be very proud on and should be much better known and should be much more influential in the way that decisions are taken. Yes.
Uh, thank you uh, for, for those answers, gentlemen. Uh, turning to your uh, paper, uh, Jeremy, you mentioned that further fiscal devolution is both feasible and desirable if there is a, a no vote, but you would acknowledge and accept that there's absolutely no guarantee that that will happen? Uh, yes. Uh, I had the great joy of uh, chairing uh, Nicola Sturgeon and the leaders of the four other four parties represented at Holyrood at a series of events in January and February. Uh, and uh, I was really quite excited when really Willie Rennie announced that he was asking uh, Simon Campbell to speak with representatives of the other uh, unionist parties at Westminster and Holyrood and see if they could come together to form a view on a package of further devolution measures, in further, in, uh, including further financial devolution, that they would all agree upon and that they would give some undertaking would be put into practice in the event of a no vote. I thought that was extremely valuable uh, because it would allow those voting in the referendum to have a far clearer idea as to what no meant, while at the same time uh, we were trying to determine as fully as we could what yes would mean. Uh, unfortunately, um, the, the Campbell II plan, as I think it was called, uh, did not come to fruition. We've seen uh, some propositions from the three parties as to what they might do, some more substantial than others, uh, and, as you say, with absolutely no guarantee that any of them would actually come into fruition. So all I'm expressing there is my view that further devolution, including further financial devolution, is perfectly feasible and also desirable. Uh, but you're right, nothing is guaranteed. Uh, and unfortunately, the three parties and the Westminster and Holyrood uh, uh, representation uh, does not appear to be united on what the way forward would be. So we wait and sees as to what might happen, uh, and we don't really know what no means. Thank you. And one final uh, sort of two-part question, I suppose, in relation to a currency union. The, the first, I suppose, is a, a quite, a, and a, maybe it could be built to be a sort of academic uh, point. But I've been quite uh, frustrated when uh, those who uh, question uh, a currency union have. Uh, made the point that this will be a, a loss of sovereignty to Scotland. It seems a peculiar uh, argument to me, and I don't know what your perspective is, because clearly in such a, a set of circumstances, and I think if Professor Simpson made the point as well, it would be fiscal policy curbs for the rest of the UK as well. It would be two sovereign entities pooling uh, sovereignty together. So by comparison with Scotland's current situation, it would actually be an act of sovereignty and it surely couldn't be described as, as a loss of sovereignty, certainly not with Scotland's current position, I would have thought that's maybe a, a sort of academic point, you can comment that if, if you will but uh, for you specifically um, it, it, Professor Pete uh, I'm aware that the Economy, Energy and Tourism uh, Committee expressed some disappointment uh, that there hasn't been uh, willingness from uh, the UK government to have uh, technical discussions uh, about the possibility of a currency union. I wonder if you could talk a little about that. Well, first of all, I deliberately in my paper, uh, and I hope in the first answer I gave on the currency union, refer to a continuing currency union, because this is effectively what it is, um, under somewhat different circumstances, but it's a continuation of the union we have at this stage on the currency front. Uh, secondly, uh, as I've said, uh, in terms of sovereignty, uh, there would be less, in my view, scope for independent uh, economic policy decision-making, certainly macro and possibly to an extent micro, under a continuing currency union than would be the case with an independent currency. So there is a, there is a loss of independence, ability to be independent on policies in the continuing currency union compared to the independent currency. Thirdly, so far as negotiations are concerned, uh, I do agree that it would have been desirable, probably not government to government, but with the, at least the Bank of England in the first instance, to discuss some of the important issues around how a continuing currency union would work in the event of independence. I would have expected that to be the first steps. I've read very carefully what the Governor of the Bank of England has stated. I've read very carefully what the Permanent Secretary to the Treasury has stated. Their nuances are somewhat different from what the Chancellor and others have said. 
Uh, and I think that uh, one can't take from either the governor or uh, the permanent secretary that never ever could there be under any circumstances a currency union. There were a lot of issues, a lot of concerns, a lot of things to be thrashed out. And just like some other areas, people don't want to talk about things until after the independence debate. But that means we're in a situation where just as we don't know what no means, we really are uncertain about what yes means. Uh, and independence with a, a continuing currency union would, I think, be very different in the way it impacted than uh, moving down some of the other paths. So I would have welcomed further negotiation. It's not going to happen, uh, even at a technical level. So we have to try and do the best we can without having that um, negotiation taking place. Could I, could I just add something? I think um, <clears throat> much is made of the constraints of our currency union, and in particular Jeremy referred to the limitations on monetary and fiscal policy, but I think we have to be realistic and realise that for a small open economy like Scotland, it doesn't matter what currency arrangements you have, your uh, independence in terms of flexibility on monetary and fiscal policy or efficacy is fairly limited. And that's not only true of a small economy, even the Uni United Kingdom, which is a large economy, is subject to the disciplines of the international financial markets in terms of determining the long-term or medium-term even rate of interest. So I don't think we should get hung up about questions of overall uh, macro level fiscal or monetary policy. But I do wish to slightly differ from Jeremy in suggesting that there would somehow, as part of the monetary union, have to be constraints on individual tax policies. I don't see that that would be the case at all. I think uh, there's no reason that, that I can understand why uh, Scotland or anybody else who's in a country union couldn't have whatever particular rates of tax on particular services or commodities or income by range that they wanted to. The only constraint is on the overall, <clears throat> excuse me, on the overall budget balance and on the supply of money and the rate of interest. That's the only constraint, and as I say, these constraints are fairly academic in a way. If I may just add to that, um, I, first of all, I, I think that uh, it may not be uh, necessary from economic and financial analysis to have constraints on individual elements of fiscal policy, but I suspect as part of the negotiation, uh, the rest of the UK might wish to see some constraints imposed if they thought policies such as lower corporation tax might damage parts of the economy close to or competing with Scotland. That I, it's a, not a matter of should, but would, I think, is the way that I might see it happening. And so far as Scotland is a small independent country, I, that's absolutely right. A very useful paper from Professor David Skilling for the Scottish Government a, a year or more back just did emphasise uh, that small independent countries have to run very tight monetary and fiscal policies and that's particularly the case when they're dependent on a volatile and somewhat uncertain revenue stream for a high part of their revenue. So yes, Scotland would have to run a tight ship with an independent currency, but other elements would be uh, unleashed in a way that wouldn't be the case um, with uh, a currency union. Uh, so yes, tight monetary and fiscal policy, but it would be able to work its way through that looking entirely at the interests of Scotland rather than being, being reliant upon the UK to make decisions on interest rates and to, to set specific constraints on the fiscal side. OK, uh, Michael, to be followed by Jean. Thanks very much, Convener. And, and to try and sort of follow this uh, theme of drawing lessons, I, I'm always mindful um, that, that often we compare apples with oranges and it's a dangerous thing to do and to continue the sort of fruit based metaphor to also not to cherry pick uh, but I'm sort of tempting fate by doing something very close to that by uh, looking at um, Professor Pete's paper in which he, 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 he quoted the observer who said that the only the only terms which a currency union would be feasible would be ones that no self-respecting nationalists could accept. We've just had a discussion about 
the, the suitability of a currency union, what the implications of that would be. Um, and you suggested earlier that even if we were to have a currency union at the outset and there's some argument around whether in the event of a, a yes vote people would accept that, that in amicable terms we should continue with a currency union, at some point we would be faced with the, the potential of, of having to, to break that currency union because we become divergent economies. And that looks very similar to me to the situation that happened in the, the Czechoslovakian situation where the Czech Republic and Slovakia both amicably wanted to go their separate ways. They amicably wanted to continue with a currency union, but it lasted barely weeks. Um, can we draw comparisons with that? And, and if they are, what comparisons can we draw? Well, I freely confess that I haven't studied the Czech or Slovak currency union, but my understanding is that uh, the reason that it foundered so quickly was that, in fact, one of the parties, I don't know which one, uh, made it fairly clear that it only regarded it as a short-term um, arrangement and that it wanted out fairly soon. And once, of course, once the markets picked up on that, then that, that was over. Uh, that was my understanding. It might be wrong. Um, I don't think, um, in the case of Scotland and England, there would be any desire on the part of either party to break it up in the short term. I, can't, I can see in the long term, as people have talked about, if the paths of the two economies diverged fairly dramatically or significantly, then um, let's say the Scottish uh, government might think in terms of starting its own currency. But I would have thought that was really quite a long way down the line. And you have to remember that going back to the only credible, compar comparable experience we've had, which is when Ireland left the UK in 1922, it stuck with the pound sterling from then until as late as 1979. And uh, it did so, by the way, without the benefit of a formal currency union, but at least it did so. And so I don't think that there's any reason to suppose that there should be any um, speculation, to, and indeed I I'm struggle to actually see. I don't know enough about the Czechoslovak thing, but if you have a continuation of the status quo as we have here in the UK, I struggle to see how financial market speculation could break it up, but maybe there's something I'm missing. I just don't know. I, I think that uh, it is, well, there are, there are two conundrums. One is how you decide whether the terms of a currency union would be acceptable, uh, where, you know, the extent to which one would have to yield a degree of independence on economic policies, would that be acceptable in order to achieve the continuing currency stability and what that would mean for trade and potentially for the financial sector, etc. So that, that is a trade-off, as I've said before. Um, and the, the observer I quoted uh, believes that the terms will be so strict that they would not be acceptable, and you'd end up with a form of independence so light as to be virtually uh, unnoticeable as a change in terms of the ability to make policies. But that's that would come out as part of the negotiation, but it, it's there as an uncertainty, uh, and there is always the risk that uh, the, the outcome could be one that caused a very difficult decision to be made. Uh, I mean, Malcolm Chisholm also mentioned this issue of, of how long... Uh, a currency union would last and questioned how I can be discussing the, the need to move away from the currency union and yet at the same time accept that to be a stable arrangement. It is difficult. I think the Czech-Slovak problem, uh, from my limited understanding of it, was different. First of all, in the terms that there was no long-term expectation. And secondly, that the two countries were so different and that it was very clear to the markets which was the strong member and which was the weak, and if they broke out, which way the currencies would go. So you had a one-way bet. Now, if Scotland and the rest of the UK were in a currency union and the oil sector was doing very well, um, which, which way would the currency go if the currency union split up? If you hadn't, would, would the Scottish currency be stronger than the pound or weaker than the pound? Uh, I don't know. Uh, a lot would depend on the policies. A lot would depend on what was happening to... Uh, to the offshore sector, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think that it would be necessary to have a perceived commitment 
for a considerable number of years, and I think David is right in saying that the divergence of the economy, if that was the cause for moving to an independent currency, would be some years down the turnpike rather than in the very short term. And I think that would allow the markets to see a currency union as stable for an extended period and be aware they would have plenty of warning if that were, were likely to change and be able to make preparations and give Scotland time to establish its credibility in such a way that moving to an independent currency would be something that didn't cause the markets to take fright, which enabled a, a rational uh, and manageable process to an independent currency if that was needed. So I think it's very different from the, the Czech and Slovak. Pro I, I also actually think it's very different from Ireland, which you know, that is 92 years ago. Uh, and I think economic circumstances are slightly different and financial circumstances now than they were then. So I think uh, Ireland is a fascinating case and it was very generous of the United Kingdom to allow Ireland to go independent with no debt. I'm not sure if it knew it was doing it at the time, but uh, I don't think one can expect the same generosity uh, or the same stability without a formal currency union as happened when, when Ireland went its own way. Well, I, I don't... Uh, I don't pretend to be an expert on Irish history, but I don't think it was a question of generosity. I think it, uh, mm. it was a necessity mm. that they wanted a peaceful settlement, um, and, uh, and the Irish wanted a peaceful settlement, and it was done in exchange, as I say, for moving the border, which only goes to show my point that the question about currency union and debt and everything else is all going to go into one great big melting pot. And I, for one, would happily give up our claim to Berwick and Carlisle <laughs> if in return we could cancel our share of the UK debt. <laughs> that yeah, but, may yeah. not be sufficient for the UK government this time. <laughs> yeah, because moving the, the, the borders in Ireland worked well. Um, the, the, the situation, though, that you've outlined um, in terms of conceiving a country union and wanting to have a country union in the best interests of, of both parties still leads from your evidence to the conclusion that at some point the divergence will create a, a, a force which will, will uh, see Scotland one way or another uh, going to its own currency. Plan B, if you like. Um, but we don't have a plan B. Um, we're told that it will be a currency union. That's all that's on the table. How important an issue in terms of the stability of that currency union to the financial sector, to the markets, to those who would be assessing Scotland's uh, debt uh, ability and credit ratings. How important is that plan B? Well, um, I don't think there's a plan B for the simple reason that there's a, an implicit plan A and a half, which everyone has been talking about, which is that even if, uh, and I don't believe it because I can't believe that a, a government uh, would cut off its nose to spite its face, that in the very, very unlikely event that um, Westminster decided to do that, and as I say, I just don't believe that it would. Nobody else believes it either in south of the border. If it did, then there's also there's the option of uh, simply continuing to maintain sterling on an informal basis without an agreed arrangement with the rest of the UK. Now, that would actually be, in many ways, to Scotland's advantage because it wouldn't be constrained by the type of agreements that we're talking about to, as far as budget deficits and monetary uh, controls are concerned. But I think that everyone who's looked at it agrees that the best solution would be an agreed uh, monetary and fiscal arrangement, which we call a currency union, and I'm perfectly sure that that's what will happen. We've had the question raised of sterlingisation previously. Uh, I may concern is that if there was no perceived security on the currency arrangement, that not only would there be a risk the markets would determine that that justified higher costs of borrowing for Scotland, but also that there would be the risk of capital flight and of corporate flight, uh, because there would be seen as a lower risk solution, which would be to locate funds and indeed activity within the rest of the UK if that's where the major markets were uh, and there were risks that uh, an independent Scotland 
uh, as part of a currency board or sterlingization arrangement, might uh, be subject to volatilities, high interest rates and uncertainties. So I, I, I'm, I am not sure that that is an outcome that will be stable and in the interests of Scotland, which is why I would devote considerable attention to trying to find a currency union solution that is acceptable to both parties, given the implicit logic that David has repeated that this would be in the interest of the rest of the UK as well as in the interest of Scotland if the right solution could be found. Whether we need a plan B at the outset, it's probably much easier for me as an independent commentator to talk through the prospect of moving to an independent currency in the fullness of time as the economies diverge than it would be for the Scottish Government. I think it would be appropriate for the Scottish and UK governments to uh, indicate that the currency union was a relationship they anticipated uh, continuing for an extended period of time, even saying that at least for 10 years or whatever it is that that would continue. But I'm just pointing to the logic of if you have different policies, if you have a different path for the economy, if you have different priorities within Scotland as compared to the rest of the UK, over time it may become desirable to break the tie with sterling, to accept that that leads to a different outcome on the exchange rate, and the money, and, but do that in order to look to the interests of Scotland in the new environment when one had established credibility um, for the management of the economy when one had the confidence of the markets and when the financial sector and others were secure that this was a Scotland that could and would run its own affairs fully in a way that they found satisfactory and they wished to be part of. Thanks for that. That's uh, really helpful in understanding the, the potential scenarios. But looking backwards, um, and again looking at uh, Professor Simpson's paper, he asked how did the UK get into this situation? Um, again, it, it's, it's easy to um, speculate about uh, what position Scotland would have been in. Uh, maybe it's not easy to speculate. Um, but we could speculate about what position Scotland would have been in had it been uh, an independent country in 2007. Um, the indications from <coughs> You know, people like the First Minister who thought that the UK banking sector was gold-plated in its regulation and he wanted to have a lighter touch regulation, we could argue that we would be in a worse position uh, than we were uh, with being part of the United Kingdom. But the reality is, if you look at the smaller countries that did exist as independent states at that time, Irish bank assets were 4.4 times Irish GDP, Iceland's bank assets were 9.8 times Iceland's GDP. HBOS and RBS alone were 21 times Scotland's GDP. Um, we wouldn't have been in a very strong position, would we? Well, um, there are two points there. First of all, if Scotland, it depends how long it have been independent for. If they've been independent since, uh, say, 1990, it would have built up a fairly healthy uh, oil fund to cushion us against any such fluctuations. Uh, I, I agree, in a way, it's impossible to speculate how would um, how what how would an independent Scotland have conducted its affairs uh, in that time? The first thing to say is that it's too late when you're in a crisis uh, to uh, try to think you can get out of it easily. It's like a bit like being being drunk and having a hangover. There's no real cure for hangover. The only cure for hangover is not to get drunk in the first place. So the only cure for a recession is not to have the preceding boom. And that's a lesson which I think painfully we're learning, we're learning now as the commentary you read in the papers all the time about people worrying about whether the, house, the present housing boom is getting out of control or not. Because everybody realizes the damaging consequences of that happening again. Now, um, that wasn't uh, actually rocket science to know that even in 1990 not to let things get out of control. Uh, way back in uh, uh, 1950, uh, uh, was it the 1950s, 
the very distinguished uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, William McChesney Martin, said famously that the role of a central banker was to take away the punch bowl when the parties get, started to get going. Now, what happened in the 19... In the, 2000, in the early part of the decade of the 2000s is that central bankers, not only in Washington but in London, did not take the post punch ball away. In fact, they topped it up quite regularly, and that led us into the situation we're in. So the, the relationship of that to your question is this, that had uh, we had a prudent uh, Scottish government in 2007, we would have been in a good position. If we did not have a prudent government, we would have a bad position. And one of the criteria of prudence, by the way, would have been to have had in place legislation providing for what happens in the event of the insolvency of a bank. A couple of comments, if I may. Uh, I, I, mean, I uh, felt that having RBS and HBOS headquartered in Scotland was extremely important at the time when they were genuinely headquartered here and when the wider effects on the wider economy were really substantial when decisions on procurement were made here, when they used the services of Scottish lawyers, of Scottish actors, Scottish accountants, etc., etc., when there was a career structure so high flyers could expect to stay within the Scottish labour market and progress. Uh, that was very good for Scotland because it provided high-value-added, high-skilled people who would work in those organisations, move out to start their own businesses, develop the rest of the financial sector. The overall impact was, was large. Now, those days went before the recession. The centre of gravity of RBS, as I stated in this committee a number of years ago, moved down south, uh, and likewise with Lloyd's HBOS. Uh, so we don't have the benefits of the headquarters effect in the same way as we had. Uh, we do have, though, as long as they are formally headquartered here, uh, the risks in the event of Scotland becoming independent. And those risks, as you've suggested, Mr McMahon, are of substance and ones that could be potentially damaging, even in the lower state that these banks now are. So what I'm interested in is having a stable and secure uh, banking sector that is delivering for Scottish households and Scottish companies the services they want in a manner that relates to their interests and that understands the environment in which they're operating. That to me is what matters. So having a, a smaller branch office, as some people call it, of RBS is fine, provided that is meeting the needs of the Scottish economy, delivering investment funds when appropriate making sure that the household needs are dealt with on a sensible, risk-averse but appropriate basis. That's why I want a diverse Scottish banking sector. That's why I welcome the arrival of new um, banks, whether they be um, Tesco or Virgin, whether they be Santander uh, and HSBC developing their activities in Scotland. I want a wide range of banks, all of them looking at the interests of the Scottish business community, large and small, and Scottish households. That's what matters. How can we achieve that? And if that involves the head offices formally moving down south, so be it. If that involves the risks of investment banking exiting Scotland, so be it. Let's have a banking sector that serves the interests of the customers in Scotland. And let's also encourage the rest of a financial sector that has done remarkably well over the period following the banking debacle, which has enabled the financial sector to remain strong and important within our economy. So let's look at what matters for Scotland under independence or under the status quo, and let's particularly focus on meeting the requirements in a customer-focused manner for the business community and the households within Scotland. And my final point, convener, um, uh, agreement with Malcolm and uh, Jamie on the desirability uh, of uh, an oil fund, I think it's regrettable now that you know we, we didn't make that decision. I think the consensus is that that decision should have been made. And I agree with Jamie that when uh, you know advice comes from civil servants, uh, it should be taken as such and not rejected on the basis of uh, 
party politics or party interest. In fact, we'll be debating such a similar situation this afternoon in the Parliament. Um, but we do know that Norway did set up an oil fund. But Norway still remains Norway. It hasn't become Nirvana. Um, Norway, with its oil fund, um, has the highest or amongst the highest rates of personal debt in the world. Uh, Health care is not free. 28% of employment is part-time employment. In terms of the Gini coefficient, it rates higher than the United Kingdom in terms of uh, wealth inequality. Um, and it doesn't invest in capital in the way that we do in this country. We have a motorway network, for example, which Norway doesn't have and doesn't aspire to. So we do things differently with our money here than, than they do uh, over there, um, although they have an oil fund. And that brings me back to the point I started out with. You, you can't compare apples with oranges and you can't cherry pick in order just to um, create the impression that all would have been well had we had an oil fund. Uh, it would have been beneficial in certain respects, but it wouldn't have solved uh, a lot of the problems if the political attitudes towards financial sector and the banking sector had continued in the way that it did. Is that correct? I'm sure you're right. I mean, it's, I, I wouldn't say for a moment that if you have an oil fund, uh, all your problems are solved. Obviously, they're not. It depends on a lot of other things. But I would say that if uh, I would rather be a minister of finance in Norway than a minister of finance in the UK, or even in an independent Scotland, let's be put it that way. I think you have a much easier job. Uh, I worked in the Scottish office for eight years uh, under Gavin McCrone, and uh, it, it was not uncommon for one to do analysis, and either the minister or a senior civil servant, and to say, well, thank you, Jeremy, that's a splendid piece of analysis, and we're very grateful for the work and the effort you put into it. However, the minister has other priorities, which has also to be taken into account, and therefore we're going to do something totally different uh, from what you've suggested. That's, that's part of uh, the way life is, but, uh, which is why I suggested that when it comes to um, making sure that one casts the light on decision-making, that transparency is important, not necessarily transparency from the civil servants. I think there has to be a constraint on civil servants going out and publishing what they want to, or ministers going out and publishing whatever they want of civil servants, whenever is the case. But that is why I am very positive about the establishment of something like an Office of Budget Responsibility, and also the development of a capability like exists at the Institute of Fiscal Studies. I think that having the light cast by these bodies, in the OBR case officially, in the IFS case with a reputation that is robust and strong, is extremely important. So if one had had a body of that ilk uh, and that reputation, uh, commenting on the need for an oil fund and getting that out into the public domain, stimulating demand, coming before this committee, if it had existed, and saying, look, this is the justification for going down that route. You call the minister to account and say, why isn't he doing it? That, to me, would have had the opportunity of improving uh, decision-making and perhaps have led to the right decision, perhaps not. But it would have cast the light on it, evidence-based, informed analysis that enables you to ask the questions and that, make, that cause government to account, to me, is very valuable. And that's what's needed in Scotland under this regime or under independence. Uh, we've still got three members of the committee who wish to ask questions, so I'm actually going to call a recess so folk can have a natural break and get a wee bit of a breather. I just want to make one or two wee comments uh, just for, to see if the panel have got any response. Uh, and, um, a couple of months ago, the Sunday Times ran an article about Norway. It said it's got the world's highest per capita productivity and that part-time employment is a choice because people prefer to have a higher quality of life than actually work to increase an income, which is, in terms of purchasing power parity, 58% per capita higher than the United Kingdom also is an exceptional low level of child poverty. Uh, and in terms of Slovakia, since its independence in, in 1994, it's had the highest rate of economic growth uh, in Europe and is the world's highest per capita manufacturer of cars now, not having had an industry uh, to speak of before 94. So did, does, does, did Mr. Uh, did, sorry, does David and uh, Jeremy agree 
that um, independence of itself, or indeed staying within the union of itself, will not uh, lead to success is quite clearly the policies um, that are enacted either within the union if we stay or that an independent Scotland would actually enact that would make the real difference to people's lives, not the constitutional change of itself. Yeah, I would agree with that. Very much. Yeah. Especially I, I like the fact that you started off with the word productivity because that, although it's a boring sounding word that economists use, that's the key to everything else because without, without improvements in productivity, you won't get uh, the growth in total output and less, you won't get the growth in tax revenues. And without growth in tax revenues, you won't be able to sustain your uh, public services or let alone look for improvements in the quality of public services. I, I also agree with you. I, I think it is, and I included as an annex to my paper a note I put to the Economy Committee in March, and I, in the 30 years I've been looking at the Scottish economy, one has this continuing issue of disappointing levels of productivity, disappointing levels of new firm formation, disappointing levels of growth of firms, uh, and, and disappointing contributions in terms of business development and innovation. Uh, and I don't know why. I, it's not just a matter of not having the banks funding things. It's not cured by having a government bank that pours money in in different ways. I. I think it's hugely important to try to understand why there has been this disappointment on productivity. What is different in Norway from Scotland? We've got this amazing success in our higher education research and development, which is not translated into an innovative um, set of sectors within the economy. It's not translated into high levels of business investment in research and development. Why do we have a level higher, higher education, research and development, top of the lead table, and business investment, research and development, bottom of the lead table. What causes that? Why do we have a low level of business inv investment? Why do we have insufficient companies with the ambition to export, the ambition to diversify their exports? What is going on that prevents all the marvellous attributes there are being translated into a vibrant, successful, innovative and high investment and high value added sector within Scotland. I don't know the answer to that, but I'd be far more interested in exploring that and developing that and finding means of changing that pattern than getting bogged down all the time in the constitutional debate. This matters to me more than anything, and there are means within the existing settlement of exploring it and examining it, and I think it is you know, there's something going wrong there that I don't yet fully understand. And I, I do think the, the greatest solution for a successful Scotland will be working on innovation, investment, ambition and development across a range of sectors that could happen and becoming a high value added, high investment, high level of innovation economy that Scotland could be. That to me would be success. To say this is an area I was going to touch on if it didn't come up in the questions from colleagues, I've still to ask them later on. But, uh, but in the meantime, what we'll do is we'll have a wee break until about 11:45, a uh, couple of minutes either way, um, depending on how. F f okay, go on.
And the next person to ask questions will be Jean, to be followed by Gavin. Uh, thank you, convener, and thank you both very much for the discussion that we've had so far. I think it's been absolutely fascinating. Um, maybe just to, to keep going from where we were, uh, during the course of this morning there's been reference made to the kind of advice that might be available um, and uh, interpretation of the economic situation um, by the, uh, the financial the Fiscal Policy uh, Commission, uh, or the equivalent of the OBR. Um, given what you said, that you know a few people saw the recession coming, um, but you also said it's impossible to have a crystal ball and see what's going to happen next year. What I mean, th these are kind of slightly contradictory remarks, as though if we put enough people working on this plan, they could see the future. I mean, if I think, uh, Jeremy, you suggested that we really did need to look at a kind of a 10-year plan looking at, at oil, looking at so on, but on the other hand, it's impossible to say what, what excitement might happen, what discovery might be made, uh, what opportunities might arise for a, for a, for a nation, for a people, for a, for a county, for a town. So how would you reconcile that? I think that uh, one can't ever get beyond the fact that all forecasts are more or less uncertain. One has to accept that. But I think what both the OBR and the Institute of Fiscal Studies do in this longer-term arena is to produce, if you like, a public sector balance sheet which goes into the 10 years, 20 years, and tries to look at various alternative scenarios for key parameters and to see what impact variations in those would have, could have, on the public finances. Whether it means looking at demographic change and its impact on health expenditure, or whether it's looking at the various possible streams of revenue from North Sea oil and gas under different scenarios and getting a, f a feel of the context and the different scenarios within which that is working. I mean, this is good business planning, if you like. I, I'm chair of the Board of the Trustees of the Zoological Society, and we have different scenarios of if we get a panda baby or if we don't, and we plan on the basis of the less uh, optimistic of those scenarios uh, and hope that the more optimistic comes to being... Uh, but one, one undertakes one's five, ten-year planning on the basis of looking at a central expectations but scenarios around that and what the longer-term work enables an understanding of which are the critical parameters and getting a feel of that. Not to be 100% accurate, because that won't happen, but just to get that feel. And I think that you know, the OBR has, has various roles at the UK level, it produces the forecasts that are used for the public finances, which is not proposed at the moment in Scotland, but I suggest would be desirable in the, in the event of independence or very substantial fiscal devolution. It produced the forecasts for individual budget measures of the, the cost implications, and that's where the proposal from Mr Swinney before this committee, what, four weeks ago, three weeks ago, uh, is that the... Scottish Fiscal Commission should comment on the government's uh, forecast rather than providing the forecast for individual elements. Uh, that's, maybe that's satisfactory when the extent of uh, devolution under the Scotland Act is, is limited. Uh, I'm disappointed in the amount of resources that would be given to the Fiscal Commission. I would like to see um, them given a little more opportunity to at least comment on the wider forecast and to start the process at looking at the longer term. But certainly when we come to independence or very substantially enhanced fiscal devolution, I think there is a need for this longer term balance sheet approach alongside very severe inspection at the very least of the government's forecast in a transparent manner that informs this committee and the public and enables them to judge whether the degree of op there's a degree of over-optimism or insufficient clarity in some areas 
that cast doubt on the forecast for the budget and the implications that has for the economy. So I'm a great believer in transparency. I'm a great believer in scenarios being developed to understand the alternative paths the, the public finances and therefore the economy could take. And I'm a great believer for having very well-resourced bodies that can do that, that have a status that enables them to be listened to and enables this committee and others to actually be influential and effective in its crucial role within our democracy. Do you think the OBR is too close to the government? No. The Westminster government? No, I, I've got huge respect for Robert Choate and his people. Uh, we've had the great advantage of having them up every year, sometimes two or three times a year, and I've hosted them at the David Hume Institute in the past, just as they've given evidence here. I don't think you could, you could call Robert Choate too close. Uh, I mean, I think that... Uh, we, I think he does a very good job of calling the government to account. He, al he also examines uh, whether uh, the particular changes in policy are going to lead to the conclusion that government assumes they will. And uh, there have been occasions when the policy has been changed as a result of his investigation or government has accepted his analysis and, and changed their view on what the implications would be in, in public finance terms. I think he, he does, he has a good track record. He has the benefit of using a sophisticated treasury model, which again is open and available. We need a good model, and you've had evidence from the now, for that there is one being developed uh, uh, under the SRC program. Scotland needs something. The, the Strathclyde model at Fraser is a starter, but we need something of more substance uh, as we go forward. No model is perfect, but we need something that helps us to look at the interactions and the interdependencies, as Peter McGregor did with you at your last meeting. But transparency matters. And I think as we go into, into if we go into independence and we've got all these uncertainties about the public finances and all these expectations of very tight stories, I think it would be disturbing if government produced all the forecasts without at least a very strong searchlight turned on them which enabled those forecasts to be questions. My preference would be for some of this work to be done externally and delivered to government, but that looks unlikely. But at the very least, there needs to be this very strong searchlight so one has effective scrutiny. If I could just add a little to that. I, in my <clears throat> earlier part of my career, I was an academic, and in that part, I did my share of forecasting, including scenario forecasting, and I've uh, since come to regret it. And I'm extremely sceptical about the possibilities of accurate forecasting of economic affairs. Now, uh, Jeremy is right that if you have a unbiased uh, body, an outside body, you can remove the bias elements from forecast. But that, unfortunately, what you can't do is remove the much more difficult element, which is you just do not know and cannot know what the future holds. And that is true um, uh, the further you go out. Even one year from now, as I said earlier, we don't know what uh, interest rates will look like. We don't know what the stock exchange uh, index will look like. And as, we go, as you go beyond that, it's even less certain. Um, it's not down to the inability of human beings to, uh, or rather, the, it's not down to the incompetence or lack of skill of people in devising ways of forecasting. It's just due to the sheer unknowability of the future. Uh, I just had occasion before I came, uh, knowing that I was coming to this committee, I thinking that a question might come up. I took the opportunity of looking up uh, Treasury forecasting record. And the only study that I came across on Google was one uh, made of the period from 2000 to 2009, which was of the budget forecasts by the Treasury one year, two years, and three years ahead. And the results were uh, pretty uh, depressing. Um, now, that wasn't because the Treasury doesn't hire smart people. 
it's just as I said before, because of the unknowability. And I'm sure with all respect to the IFS and the OBR, that they will encounter the same problems. So my first, uh, my conclusion would be that before you are inclined to accept anybody's forecast, look at their track record. Now, the OBR hasn't been in business long enough to have much of a track record. The IFS does, and I haven't neither the time nor the resources to analyse their forecasts, but I think it would be extremely instructive to do so. I mean, I, I do know that there's never been a forecast of, of demographics, for example, that was right either. We've never... Yeah, I think our demographic forecast uh, forecasts are rather different for, because they're based on uh, biology as much as uh, not on, on, on economics. So having worked for Standard Life, I'm acutely aware that the whole business of life assurance companies is founded on the uh, predictability of human mortality and morbidity as a whole, not as an individual. You can't, I couldn't say how long you would live or anyone else here would live, but taking the totality, you can. However, that's uh, the exception. Um, so far as human affairs are concerned, which involves interactions between people, I'm afraid um, that, in my view, will remain for a very long time an impenetrable fog. And the only... It, what is the policy lesson of that? Is the policy lesson, I think, is that you must err on the side of caution. Yeah. You must be extremely cautious in making your budget provisions. And this is where we come back to the oil fund again, that if you have a... If you've built up a big um, chest of reserves, then you're in a much safer position to deal with unforeseen and unforeseeable um, calamities when they come along. Thank you. Uh, I don't disagree with anything David said. I, I mean, it, in fact, it's slightly worse than he said on the forecasting record, because we don't even know where the economy is now. The, the data will be revised over the next several years. So actually, the path over the last two or three years will look very different to economic historians in 20 years than it looks now. So it's rather difficult when you don't know where you are in trying to forecast where you're going to be. But that doesn't mean that one cannot assist decision-making by looking at the issues and the factors and, and looking at alternative paths that are potentially possible. And I entirely agree with David that it, it leads to a cautious approach, particularly in the early years of a small nation. Um, I think the other thing that I, I related to that too in two directions. One is that the, the boom and bust continues. I mean, we hear what I consider to be quite uh, frightening phrases like back to normal uh, with the economy, and I'm not quite sure what back to normal is. If back to normal is normal of 2007-8, then that's not a comfortable place to be. And how far back would we go? We seem... I mean, I, I've... Uh, run a small business and lived through now three recessions. Um, so it, is, that just, is that something else that we would just assume that might happen? Uh, that's, that's part of that. So the boom and bust will continue as long as we go along, this, follow the same kind of economic path that we're on at the moment. And what would shift that to make us look at, look at economics differently? I mean, there are organisations out there who think that we should make quite drastic changes um, to how we do our economics that, that comes perhaps uh, not quite so much market-led. I think, um, I don't think you would, I think when people talk about back to normal, what they're looking back to is that period from about, Jeremy can correct me, about 2000, uh, sorry, 1995 to 2005, which was an age period of uh, fairly uh, sustained growth, low inflation, and high employment. Um, unfortunately, it didn't last, and I don't think we truly really understand yet either why it happened or why it didn't last. We would all like to get back to it. Now, as I said before, the only way that we can avoid um, down significant downturns in the future, recessions, is not to have the preceding boom. And the way of avoiding a preceding boom is to have very a cautious monetary policy and cautious fiscal policy. In other words, not to run up 
not to run our big deficits and not to have rapid monetary expansion. Um, now, that's easier said than done. And, of course, there are always, in addition, factors that will come along uh, which you can't entirely expect. For example, there's no doubt that the factor in the financial crisis was not just the loose monetary policies in both the US and the UK, but the fact that um, in the uh, banking community, in the investment banking community, there grew up this fashion for um, derivative instruments which were then packaged and repackaged and traded until no nobody knew what it was they were buying and selling. And once it became realized that there were some nasty packages floating about, it's rather like the old game of pass the parcel. When the music stops, nobody wants to be holding the parcel that's got all the bad mortgages in it, but nobody knows which one it is. And so that was, once it became, once the, some of the banks began to realize that some of the people they were dealing with were passing them dud packages, then they started they stopped lending the money, and that's what's called counterparty risk. And that was, a, I think, a, perhaps a unique element in that particular crisis. I mean, there, as I said before, there is a, since the middle of the 19th century, we have this periodic cycle of boom and bust. Each time, however, there is some slightly different elements. So there's a general pattern, but there's also elements that are peculiar to that particular crisis. Now, what it will be next time... I don't know. Everybody's looking at the housing market right now, partly because the housing market played a big part in the last episode. But that doesn't mean to say it will be the housing market. It might be something else. But as long as we have, as I said, prudent and cautious monetary and fiscal policies, then we should be able to protect ourselves at least from the very worst recessions, I believe. I... I I agree with uh, what David's saying. I mean, in terms of back to normal, when normal was good, uh, I often look back. I had 12 years as group chief economist at RBS from 1993 to 2005. I chose my period very fortuitously. Uh, uh, that was a good time, and uh, when I retired was a good time to retire. Um, I'm not saying that I would have in any way been better than my successors or others in forecasting what was going to happen and preventing what happened, but uh, 1993 to 2005 were very good years uh, for our economy and very good years to be engaged uh, in an economic role there. Um, so we have to be careful about what we will in back to normal. We certainly have to have conservative monetary and fiscal policies for an extended period, um, boom or bust, the housing market, yes, of course, we're paying attention to it now. I'm not sure that I would have given top priority to stimulating demand in the housing market. Uh, I might have given more priority to stimulating supply uh, and helping to equalize the position that way. Uh, and we d certainly need to watch that we're not going back to something like the situation last time round. But as David's implied, the next problem will be a new one rather than the old one repeated. Uh, and we've got to learn to be prepared for that. And the best way of being prepared is being secure, conservative with a small C and having stable policies. The only other point I'd make uh, is that I think for Scotland, uh, it is important, I go back to the National Performance Framework, to be absolutely clear about what Scotland wants. And if we want a different set of priorities, if we want to give greater priority to equity within our um, population than to growth per se. Let's be clear on that and then let's consider policies against a clear and precise set of objectives that are Scotland's and that Scotland wishes to measure and wishes to judge performance against rather than just accepting you know, the fastest rate of growth is the necessarily the best. Let's be clear on what our objectives are. And finally, just on, on the Point, the, the, the point that we left uh, before the, the break was on your uh, statement about about innovation and what is what is in, inhibiting uh, the manufacturing growth, exports, energy, and companies, and so on. Um, would you uh, say that Scotland is an independent country? And the two two points I want to make about this one one is is not kind of relevant, but that the say the strength of the pound is is perhaps 
suits another part of the United Kingdom better than it fits with uh, Scotland. And secondly, um, that I believe that there's such a thing as, as a kind of business, commercial, industrial culture which can exist in any country. And that comes with a belief that actually you're working within a unit with people that you, that, that you know. I think the smaller the unit, if we look at some of the smaller countries and there, how they've come through the, the recession uh, it is interesting, but also how, how they do re relate to... I mean, there's a great debate just now about the, the money for research and development, but there can be all the money in the world if we're not using it. And actually, compared with other countries, Scotland is not using uh, academia as it should, I think. But it, or, or even just by comparison, we, we don't... There are, there are too few direct links understanding the kind of R&D that's happening in the university and how we might use them. However, I do think that that comes... that There needs to be an energy, and this is one of the things that I do think will, uh, uh, is, it's difficult to articulate, but it's essential in terms of, a, of, of, of an independent Scotland, that actually the energy that's needed for that is possible with a much smaller country. And finally, because I, won't, I, know, I probably won't get allowed back in again, just on your point, uh, Jeremy, about the, about the debt, about Scotland's debt, and that whether legally, legally we may not be obliged to pay this, but, you know, morally and so on, we've had the use of the money, there needs to be some payback. But I wonder and perhaps question your assertion that the market um, would be... Uh, would be less keen to, to recognise Scotland as an independent nation if it, if it somehow defaulted on that, whereas the market defaults on all kinds of things and is hardly held to kind of some moral high ground. Three points there, I think. Um, first of all, on sterling, uh, I, I don't think one can um, blame a strong pound for what's been happening in the Scottish economy. I, uh, and I don't necessarily believe that an uh, independent Scotland with its own currency would tend to see that currency depreciate against sterling rather than appreciate. I think that's uncertain, and um, I don't think one can say that the value of sterling is wrong for Scotland. I, I think that's a difficult argument to sustain. Uh, so far as the the culture and the R&D points that you made are concerned, I think this is fascinating. I, I mean, is there a a culture within Scotland that applauds endeavour to be creating and running businesses and accepts that failure does take place and should be accepted and encouraged to try again, as happens in the US and elsewhere. Uh, is there a drive for business people or students leaving university or FE colleges to want to create businesses and grow businesses, it doesn't seem to be there to the same extent as one might hope. So would an independent Scotland see those animal spirits unleashed? Perhaps. Perhaps it would be somewhat different. I, no one can tell. But I think it is... I sometimes think that in Scotland uh, success and failure are equally damned, that it's not good to to fail. Failure is something that isn't accepted as, as inevitable in, in the entrepreneurial development and being too successful is only now becoming applauded. And So I, I, I do think the culture does need to be looked at and the R&D point is, it, it fascinates me. You, I think that there is something wrong with the incentive mechanisms for the use of R&D in higher education institutions. I was many years ago Vice Chairman of the Scottish Higher Education Funding Council and, and the round of funding was determined on the number of articles that were generated or the number of academic success stories, rather than related to, is that research being used? And if a, uh, an academic was doing great research on genomes A and B, and genomes A was going to get the most articles and genomes B was going to lead to a booming life science business, then genomes A somehow took precedent because that was what the incentive mechanisms were set up to do. So one needs to encourage academics to want to make best use directly or with others of their work for the success of Scotland. And one also wants to encourage businesses 
to want to use that R&D, to want to understand it. And, and it's not yet happening. Uh, and I think tremendous to have the success in HE and R&D, but disappointing that it's not being translated into the innovation we're looking for. How we achieve it, I don't know. But I think it is something that merits attention. Uh, and finally, on debt, um, it may not be right that markets would act in the way I suggest they would, but I think it is likely they would act that way, that they would see uh, any failure to take on the level of debt that the UK and others deemed appropriate, uh, any suggestion of default or anything akin to that would be likely to lead to markets demanding higher interest rates for borrowing by an independent Scotland. How high, I don't know. But I think it's absolutely critical that in the early years, Scotland demonstrates its credibility and its appropriate approach to the public finances and to the running of its economy. That has to, be, has to secure its position in order to work with the markets and then to be able to do the best it can for its nation. I, I agree uh, with Jeremy's last sentence that I think the, the single biggest factor determining what rate of interest of which an uh, independent Scottish government will begin to borrow is the market's judgment of its, the prudence of its uh, public finances and what they see as the prudence of the, whoever then is the Minister of Finance. I don't think, however, I don't agree with Jeremy at all about the question of there being any connection between uh, whatever share may be negotiated in uh, our uh, notional share of the uh, UK debt and uh, any question of default because, as I said, there is no question of default and I don't really think the markets will think like that. But I agree, I don't know, and so we shall just have to wait and see. Uh, more important is the point which you raised about culture and which Jeremy touched on as well. And I don't, like him, I don't have a simple answer who does to the question of culture, but I do think there's one factor which may link... Um, economic success with constitutional arrangements and that's the factor of confidence and I think one of the reasons why we have uh, an observably lower rate of investment in innovation among Scottish businesses is that we just don't have enough people with confidence about the future we don't have enough entrepreneurs who are prepared to take risks and that being the case I don't ex I don't think we can wait until such people come along by natural selection I think we have to create an environment in which we attract people, businessmen, entrepreneurs, from all over the world to come here. And we've got to make an economic environment that's attractive to them. Thank you. Hey, Gavin, to be followed by John. Yeah. Um, first question is for Professor Pete. Um, in your paper, the second page, you talk about the role of the Fiscal Policy Commission. Um, and you say this, uh, clearly the role of the FPC in the context of the Scotland Act is limited. It will be examining the Scottish Government's estimates for revenue to be raised. Um, but even in this limited context, a few voluntary hours input seems small, as does the sum available to buy in external input. Um, I wonder if you can just expand on, on that viewpoint, please. Well, all I've seen at the moment is the paper from... John Swinney and the discussion that you as a committee had with him. But my understanding is that there are to be three members who will work on a voluntary basis and a sum, I think, is it £20,000 made available for research to support their work? And now, if they're buying in analysis on, say, three different um, items of taxation, um, and you've got six and two-thirds thousand pounds for each item, uh, that's not a lot. Um, if you're relying upon volunteers to undertake the work, I'm sure we've got very good people out there who would take it on, but the time is likely to be quite limited. So, and one would want them to take this very seriously because it's the starting point uh, for actually doing this type of analysis and developing the role of a commission, which is likely to expand. So I just believe that this looks pretty limited, even as a kickoff. And I know funds are tight, 
but I'd like to have seen maybe some payment, at least for the chairman of this commission, on a totally part-time and limited basis, and some more funds for buying in good quality research, preferably from Scottish higher education institutions, to enable them to develop the ability to analyse the Scottish economy more and elements of it. There's not enough work going on in Scotland in the higher education institutions on analysis of the Scottish economy. You know, setting on one side the work of David Bell, Peter McGregor, Brian Ashcroft and other, all of whom tend to be of my generation rather than the next generation, unfortunately. Thank you. Um, I guess both you and Professor Simpson will uh, say that output is more important than input. But, I mean, in terms of the... Uh, the input there's some available. Do you, do you have a personal view on what, what sort of sum you were expecting or should be there to, in order to, to kick it off properly? Or are you just saying that the sum that is there is, seems low? I, I don't know if you have a, a more exact... Uh, I haven't got an exact figure. I just know that 20,000 doesn't take you far these days, uh, especially when you're paying the full costs, as you are now with HE institutions rather than just the marginal costs. You're paying full costs. I would have preferred that some analysis of the work that was required and then giving some indicative costing of that rather than coming up with a figure which looks to me somewhat arbitrary. Okay, thank you. Um, moving away from that issue then, the question for, for, for both of or for either of you, um, if Scotland were to uh, go independent in March of 2016, what is your view on the likely borrowing costs uh, that an independent Scottish government would face um, relative to uh, the UK government? Well, I can honestly say I haven't uh, thought about the numbers and I don't know <clears throat> I don't know of any reliable estimates. I'm quite sure that there would be an initial premium on the costs. Uh, as I say, however, a, b a big factor will be the market's subjective assessment of what the cap capability is of the Scottish government to repay the loan. And that will depend primarily, I think, on their judgment of the personnel and policies of that government. Uh, I, obviously, I, I, like David, have not undertaken research on this. I've seen the work of the National Institute of Economic and Social Research of uh, Angus Armstrong and Monique Bell, which looks as good quality as one can at the moment. But so much will depend on the form that independence takes. So much will depend on the currency arrangements, on the arrangements for management of the public finances, uh, etc., etc. So the markets will be looking at the extent to which rigorous and uh, secure policies are in place and also at a currency union or whatever the way forward is. There will be a premium. If it's all managed well, it will be relatively small and could be short-lived. It would, uh, as the reputation is built and enhanced, then that premium should reduce. Okay, thank you. Um, you mentioned the phrase currency union there, uh, Professor Peter. Obviously, you, you both answered a number of questions uh, in relation to that, so I want to ask a couple of different questions around it. Um, are, there, are there any good examples of countries that have separated and then successfully retained a formal currency union? Retained? Yes. Um, I'm not sure if there are, unless... Um, no, I can't think of any. By then, I can't think of any, um, apart from Czechoslovakia, which went the other way. So uh, I, I just don't have any evidence. They, I mean, such... Um, there have been a number of cu currency unions in history which have been quite successful. I think uh, Belgium and Luxembourg is the one that springs to mind. That lasted quite a long time. But the important thing is that we're not... We talk about having a currency union, as I said before, as if it were something new. We're not creating something new. We're simply having a continuation of the status quo, but adding on certain agreed constraints on each government. Both governments, we mustn't forget, um, concerning their behaviour. That's all. And so I can't see any... Uh, I, I, once these constraints have been agreed, I can't see any forces which would tend towards the breaking up of such a currency union. 
I have to agree that the number of examples out there is limited, um, as it is for um, sterilization type operations. And the, perhaps the classic positive example there is Hong Kong, but the level of reserves that Hong Kong holds uh, enables it, uh, as such that are uh, uh, beyond the wildest dreams of avarice so far as an independent Scotland is concerned, and that enables them to manage having a financial sector of substance and having a, a very stable relationship with the dollar, and that being secure and acknowledged by the market. So I don't think there's a good example out there, but uh, uh, I think that, uh, uh, that it is achievable, uh, but the exact basis on which it's achieved remains to be determined. Thank you. Um, let, I mean, let's assume there's, there's a yes vote in September. Let's assume a, a currency um, union was agreed uh, between the two governments. I just wanted to explore the, this idea of permanence or, or the market seeing that it's not just a kind of short-term arrangement. There have been uh, comments made in the press by you know, quite senior people saying this would uh, be for the first couple of years and then we'd do our own thing. The white paper itself um, it says quite openly it would be up to the people of Scotland thereafter to decide uh, what arrangement it preferred most in terms of currency. So there are certainly some uh, indications out there that there are at least some people in Scotland who would, who would prefer not to be in a currency union for terribly long. If, if, if it were to work, what do, you, what do you think would need to be said by both the UK government and the Scottish government uh, to give um, a clear indication to the markets that it was a permanent or semi-permanent agreement? Would, would there need to be a formal declaration? Would there need to be a time scale put on it? Because I think there would certainly be some suspicion um, that, uh, at least on one side, it, it, it wouldn't be permanent. No, I would agree. I think uh, Jeremy earlier on, in answer to another question, suggested 10 years as a period of declaration. And it would seem to me that seems a perfectly sensible time period. The problem is that even if a declaration of that type was made, uh, it's always up to the will of the people of Scotland to change it, uh, as the, is stated in the White Paper. So in addition to any form of declaration, there has to be a belief in the markets and elsewhere that this would be sustained. Uh, and you mentioned that there are people in favour of independence who do not see this as the right way to go for any extended period. So there would have to be a view that uh, Scotland, uh, the, the parties to the Scottish Government and potential other parties and those within Scotland did see this as the right path for an extended period and that there wasn't going to be a growth of pressure for moving very rapidly to an independent currency in order to achieve the flexibility that would to an extent be constrained by being part of a union. So it would have to be seen as uh, accepted by the great will of the Scottish people and the Scottish politicians, and at the same time having a statement that this was for an extended period. That then would provide the security that I, I think would permit uh, not very significant premium on interest rates and also a, a stability for the financial sector and others to work with them. I would just like to say, if I may, sure. that I think uh, there's a risk that we can all get hung up on the kind of subjects that academics like to debate about what's the optimal type of currency arrangement. Should it be an independent currency? Should it be a common currency with the rest of the UK? Or should it be attached to the euro or even something else? And the, the truth of the matter is that it doesn't make that much difference. If we take three countries which for looking at them from here, are broadly similar, uh, Denmark, Sweden and Finland. Finland is a fully paid out member of the Eurozone. Um, Sweden, I think I'm right in saying, has a fully floating currency of its own. And Denmark has its own currency, but kind of keeps a, tries to keep it uh, in relationship to the Euro. Um, and so the prosperity of a country is very rarely down to its choice of currency, and that shouldn't be surprising because we all know that the prosperity of a country in the end is down to, apart from luck, down to the uh, qualities of the people in it, the decisions they make, and the question of what financial arrangements you have is really a second-order matter entirely. Thank you. 
Um, if I can move on then, the, uh, we touched on again, various committee members have talked about the oil fund in their questions. Um, most analysts have projected for the first year of independence were it to happen uh, between a 5 and a 6% def deficit uh, for Scotland. How, how would you f put money into an oil fund if you're run running a deficit of 5 or 6%? Are you not then effectively borrowing money in order to put money into the oil fund? Um, can you feasibly do it at that stage, or is it something that you would do once you'd got into a surplus of some sort? Well, first of all, I don't accept the projection of numbers like that for the reasons that I've given before when we were talking about forecasting, because it's open to the Scottish Government to alter its budget in a number of ways that doesn't just involve projecting forward numbers in the same proportion that they are at the moment. However, I do agree with you that given that we all, are, as we've both said, uh, we're entering a period of fiscal tightness, um, there isn't going to be uh, a huge amount of scope for putting a lot of money right away into an oil fund, and I wouldn't pretend otherwise. I do think, however, that it should be an early objective of, of a Scottish government to start to put money into an oil fund, but I wouldn't uh, try to say what year that should be or how much. Can that, okay, so I mean, I, I take your point. You don't, you don't accept projections and, and so on. But, but theoretically, should should they start putting money in before a surplus is reached, so while, while in deficit, or are you saying it should happen once we're in surplus, whichever year that happens to be? The second of the the yeah. second. So yeah. only once you're in surplus, yeah. you think it makes sense to? Yeah. Okay. I've got a slightly different take on that. I, I mean, the first point on what the deficit would be in the first year of an independent Scotland, uh, it does depend on policies, but what I've seen thus far of the proposed policies are quite strong on additional expenditure items, but not very strong on additional tax measures. So I, I don't see anything as yet that persuades me that the deficit uh, is likely to decline as compared to what it would have been uh, under the status quo in constitutional terms. And that's quite a tough take, uh, because if we're looking to Scandinavian models, for example, um, they may be more equitable societies in many instances, but they also tend to be higher tax economies. And so we have to face up to the issue as whether an independent Scotland wishes to have high spend in a number of areas and how it wishes to finance that because I don't think the answer is to run an even larger deficit than would be the case otherwise. So far as your question on the oil fund is concerned, uh, I think what would be desirable would be to set out an anticipated path for the fiscal deficit um, and to one that was seen as prudent and likely to lead, continue to sustain uh, su sustainability of the public finances and the right path. And then if one had this exceptional year in oil and gas revenue, which took it well above the expected revenue stream, then some or all of those funds could be stashed away in a fund. And as I've said before, if the level of uh, revenue was below expectations, then I think the government would have to take that on the chin within its, its budgetary uh, arrangements. So I would not necessarily wait till there was a surplus, but I would only put funds into a fund if the level of restraints was greater than that was expected, which was deemed to be consistent with appropriate management of the public finances, if that's clear. Well, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, John. Thanks, a Convener. I mean, just to, to follow up on that point, um, I mean, presumably you could have a fund, as different organisations do, without actually having the cash in it. But following up from what you said, Professor Pete, if you've had a good year, you've got a bit of extra money from the oil and the gas, but you're still running a deficit. You could actually put the money into a fund on the, on the government balance sheet, have it kind of ring-fenced, but in a sense lend the money back to the general fund rather than borrow separately. I'm not sure how that arrangement would work. I, I can't think it through sitting here, but, but I would only move resources into the fund if the the public finances were deemed to be as was required and the level of revenue from oil and gas was above the expectation consistent with that 
uh, as appropriate state of the public finances. And then they have to be ring-fenced, they have to be moved away. Uh, whether one can then earn, one would earn a return on those funds in some way or another, whether that was then uh, returned to the fund or whether it was passed across to other parties. Uh, sorry, something is beeping here. It's on my... Oh, 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 I thought I'd switched oh. it off. <laughs> <laughs> Son of mobile phones. Uh, it was, it was a long time ago, convened. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so, but it, it, one would have to determine whether any returns on the assets in the fund were retained into the fund or transferred to the, the general budget. My preference would be for them to be returned, retained in the fund so that fund built over time. But you'd also have to be absolutely clear on what that fund was to be used for. Okay, thanks so much. I uh, don't know if you're okay, Professor Simpson, if I ask. Yeah, that's okay, that's right. Um, um, I wanted to go on to uh, some of the things you'd said in your own, in your paper about, I mean, you talk about implicit debt and explicit debt, and I was slightly intrigued by that because some of the figures seemed quite high. Could you c explain to us what you meant by implicit debt? Yeah, implicit debt is really all the spending commitments that a government enters into for the future, which are not covered by uh, explicit tax uh, um, that have taxes that have already been planned. In other words, uh, for example, the most obvious example is the promises, pensions promises for public sector workers. And they also cover things like um, NHS funding, for example. Uh, not all NHS funding may be covered by the present tax revenues or tax revenues that are foreseeable on the basis of present tax arrangements. And then there are whole sorts of other things like legacy PPI, PFI liabilities uh, and network rail expenditures and so on. And these tend to um, accumulate almost unseen, as it were. And we, when we look at the debt position of a government, any government at the moment, we tend only to look backwards at the uh, level of a debt that's been accumulated in the past. We tend not to look forward and anticipate what the liabilities in the future might be that are calculable and that are in excess of foreseeable revenues. I mean, I follow. I mean, I certainly understand the PFI PPP point because these are a real debt. Uh, they will have to be paid. I suppose I'm struggling a bit with the NHS idea because does the NHS not just live within whatever money is given to it? And I mean, any country, if you've got more money, you could give a bit more to the NHS. If you've got less money, you give a bit less. Why is there liability there? Well, because I think we all have expectations about the level of funding for the NHS, and I don't think. Uh, the, you know, with future commitments as to levels of care. I'm not sure that it's true to say that if it turned out in the future uh, that, you know, or if the foreseeable tax revenues failed to cover that, we could just cut back on these commitments at will. Even if we could, I think it'd be wise now to know about them so that when they come along, there wouldn't be unpleasant surprises. Okay. So, I mean, you actually suggest in your paper that the implicit debt, it could be over five times the explicit debt, which... Yes. That's what this American calculated. He calculated not just for the UK, but a number of other countries. And he didn't uh, go into detail on his methods, but he's a perfectly respectable academic researcher, so I had no reason to uh, dispute his numbers. It certainly sounds quite scary, and I mean, you go on to say the size of the UK government debt, explicit and implicit, seldom appears to be the subject of serious debate at Westminster. A, a run in sterling could be precipitated at any time. I, I mean, you, is that overstating it a bit? Or no, is it, no, no, it's not overstating it. I think that we've been very lucky. Well, maybe if you were conservative, you would say not lucky, but a good policy that we there hasn't been a, a run in sterling since the financial crisis broke. But that doesn't mean to say it's going away. And if, for example, the present um, mini-boom in house prices were to continue, 
uh, that could very well be eventually triggered a significant rise in interest rates, which might in turn trigger a downturn. And if we had another downturn in the economy within two or three years, then I think that very well could trigger a run on sterling. Yes, because going back earlier on in your uh, level uh, report, you said uh, when interest rates return to a more normal level. So, I mean, is your feeling that they are artificially low at the moment? Absolutely, yeah. I don't think everybody recognises that. The, the um, uh, loose money policy, quantitative easing, has meant that interest rates are at historically unprecedentedly low levels. And everyone also agrees that, that that can't go on forever because otherwise it would loose uncontrollable inflation. I mean, I personally think it's loosened quite a bit of inflation already. I think the reason why the stock market has risen, for example, in the last few years is precisely because of the availability of this money. But I don't think that it would be safe to continue to to do that. And indeed, both the Fed and, to, to a lesser extent, the Bank of England have announced plans for tapering off this rate of increase of the money supply. And that will inevitably raise interest rates back to their more normal level. I mean, Professor Pete, that, that's quite a bleak picture and suggests the UK is not doing very well. Do, do you? It is, yeah. Do economists are fairly bleak people. Uh, <laughs> do, um, do, do you share that view, Professor Pete? I certainly share the view that interest rates will rise um, and are at a, an artificially low level. Um, whether they go back to 6 7 8% or whether they stabilise at 2 or 3%, uh, I have no idea. Um, I hope that we, ha we are in a relatively low inflation environment and therefore the level of interest rates that is required will not be excessive because certainly we have to remember that any increase in interest rates uh, places a very severe burden on households as well as businesses and the risks of further um, debt problems emerging, particularly in the household sector of substance, if rates were to rise rapidly. So it's got to be managed very carefully, which is why I'm sure the Government of the Bank of England is looking to, to easing uh, the pressure on the housing market as one way of avoiding unnecessary increases in interest rates. He want to, wants to achieve that by changing the policy on stimulating demand rather than uh, changing interest rates directly. On this question of implicit, may I just come back on the implicit debt? I mean, I totally take David's point so far as PPI, PFI is concerned. Those are debts that are committed. Uh, they are not contingent liabilities. They are liabilities that are there and should be included. But I think it's a somewhat different story with how one manages the position on the health sector, for example. I think it is absolutely right one should look at what the implications should be over an extended period uh, for the public finances if the health sector was given the funds required to maintain certain standards to take account of health inflation. And we know that health costs rise more rapidly than those in other sectors. And we also know that with an ageing population, uh, demographic change leads to high health costs. So it's absolutely right to look at what the impact of that on the public finances is concerned. But I don't think you then automatically assume that that leads to an increase in debt, because what that then gives the opportunity for the government of the day to do is to determine whether it wished to stick to that commitment for health or pensions or whatever it is, whether it wishes to do so uh, and at the same time um, to reduce expenditure in other areas to compensate or to raise taxation to compensate. So the deficits can be adjusted to take account of the higher expenditure on health or pensions without necessarily leaving to the rampant increase in debt. So there are right ways of managing policy. So it's right to be aware of the risks, but one shouldn't assume that every extra pound spent on health leads to an increase in debt. That doesn't follow as night follows day. That, that's helpful. I mean, one of the suggestions we had previously was that traditionally when countries are heavily indebted, they, they quite like inflation because that uh, erodes the uh, value of the debt. Um, so, I mean, going forward for the UK, is that going to be a temptation for the UK to allow inflation? I very much hope not. Uh, I, I mean, I think that uh, if you have uh, a significant increase in inflation, you will... Uh, lead to a deterioration in the value of sterling, you'll lead to higher interest rates under the existing regime, 
uh, and that will lead to higher costs for business. It will, uh, it will also lead to a further rebound on inflation uh, as imported inflation rises, sterling falls. So it may be a lovely way of, in principle, getting rid of the lowering the, nom the real value of the debt uh, by higher inflation. But I don't think it's a stable approach to uh, solving uh, the issue. I think uh, sound policies are much more appropriate. No, no, Professor Simpson, because you're yes, saying... I, I agree with what Durham has just said. Yes. Because you're saying that, I mean, if interest rates rise, I mean, for the UK, that is going to put serious pressure on UK's finances. On UK? On UK debt, yes. if the debt stays the same or increases. Yes. There, and, the, and the interest rates increase, as I think yes. you're both suggesting they will be. Yes. I mean, that is going to put huge pressure on the UK, and will the UK not be tempted to go down that inflationary route? Absolutely. I don't believe it will be tempted down that route because that would be such a change of the policy that was deemed successful in that glorious period in days gone by and is is what all all serious parties are committed to a low inflation and stable environment going forward. It would be very difficult to move away from that and I think wrong. Okay, that's great. Um, I mean, st sticking in interest rates, we've talked already a little about um, how the, the interest rate for Scotland, if independent, would be different from the interest rate for the UK. And if I'm right in saying, I mean, we've got a number of issues in there. We've got the personnel actually running the respective economies. We've got the actual policies that would be involved. Um, it's been suggested that on the whole, smaller countries pay a premium, although I think we've also had evidence that some smaller countries are so well run that they actually end up with a lower uh, net interest rate. And, and presumably, too, I mean, the actual debt level would be a factor in there. Uh, because if you've got huge debt, presumably you're at higher risk and anyone lends you any more, it uh, is going to be at higher uh, interest rate. Um, I mean, are these the kind of main factors that are considered? Well, again, to come back to my point that I think it's not very helpful to try and put numbers in these things. For example, at the height of the Irish uh, debt crisis, there. Um, they were having to borrow at something like 15% in the commercial market, 10 years. Now the Irish government's borrowing rate 10 years is actually lower than the UK, lower than the UK. Now, I don't think for a moment that will last permanently, but it does indicate that one ought to be very careful about trying to put, put numbers on these things. Um, and I don't, therefore, uh, if we come to the original part of your question, what will be the difference between interest rates in Scotland and in the rest of the UK? The answer really is what interest rates relating to what particular type of debt. If we talk about government debt, then the, uh, any difference between the two will be due to the difference in the market's perception of the ability of each government uh, to repay its borrowing. And it's not at all clear to me that that would necessarily uh, favour the UK. As I just said a week or two ago, the Irish borrowing government borrowing rate was uh, lower than the UK. Now, on the other hand, if we talk about the more important kinds of borrowing, uh, which is commercial borrowing for long-term investment, then I think the markets will judge on the, the uh, characteristics of the borrowing company and the prospects of the, of the project. And I don't think that they will be inclined to add on any other factors to that. Right, so I can follow up a couple of points there. You, I mean, why? Can you explain why the Irish borrowing is, rate is lower or has been recently lower than the UK? Um, no, I can't. But it, it's, uh, it's just an indication of the way in which markets, especially international bond markets, can move in quite... Uh, irrational ways, or at least that are not immediately apparent to observers. And on the second point, um, you, you suggested that the government borrowing is uh, distinct from either individual or business borrowing. The two rates are not, yes. uh, not related at all or not related completely. Well, I, I can't see why business borrowing should have any particular premium uh, attached to it simply because the business is located in Scotland. Or, or negative premium, if it's what you're hinting at. Did you want to comment on that, Professor Pete? Or... Uh, my expectation would be that uh, the factors that you referred to are the main ones determining 
uh, the differential on interest rates. And yes, some small economies have lower rates, but that's because they have achieved great credibility and have very conservative policies. So other things being equal, small countries tend to have a small margin. Uh, and I think Scotland would have to gain credibility uh, over time. Uh, I think there's also an issue of the stability of the currency. If Scotland were borrowing in sterling, for example, as part of a currency union, the, the, the markets would have to be satisfied. That was likely to be sustained for an extended period before they placed a the premium. So far as corporate borrowing is concerned, I, I'd always thought that um, there tended to be a margin over LIBOR or whatever the base rate is within the economy that led to the cost of borrowing. And if the, the rate of government borrowing uh, was slightly higher here than elsewhere, I would have thought that might feed through to an equal small margin for those borrowing in the corporate sector. But the main issue will be the security of the company and the way in which it's reflected in the markets. OK, that's great. Thanks very much. OK, well, thank you very much. Now, it will f the, the session uh, has been a long one, and uh, we could discuss many things I was keen to go into, such as economic growth uh, and uh, productivity, etc. But we don't have time for that. So I'm just going to finish with uh, with one uh, question, which is really on uh, the, the, you know, it's about the, the whole point of this is about Scotland's public finances post-2014, and we've talked a lot about um, if there's a yes vote. But if there's a no vote, we've already mentioned the fact that there doesn't seem to be any uh, um, lowest common denominator in terms of the Unionist Party policies going forward if there's a no vote. Um, now, in, in the next two or three years, it's likely that um, UK parties will be involved very much so if there's a no vote in focusing on the UK general election and possibly, depending on the outcome of that election, a European referendum. Um, is it your view, therefore, that uh, there is likely to be any real focus on Scotland I mean, for example, we've heard about potentially the Barnet formula being reviewed, and or do you think it will be, um, you know, Scotland will effectively be lost in all of this? And if Scotland is not to be lost, um, and we have further devolution, could you think of one uh, fiscal power which you would would be a priority to devolve to this Parliament? Well, um, I think there are a number of questions there. First of all. Um, to answer your last question, I would say um, that is, the, I think, the most important single tax that should be devolved. Um, second of all, I don't believe that uh, the Unionist parties would have the slightest interest in um, bringing forward any additional substantial devolution legislation uh, for two reasons. One is if you look at the period after the 1979 devolution referendum, which was lost, uh, nothing was done for another 20 years. And looking at it, if you put yourself in the position of the party managers of Conservative Labour Party in London, what, why on earth should they? What is there to be gained by bringing forward some legislation concerning Scottish devolution when, as you say, much more important issues are at stake. So I can't see any uh, movement at all. And I think that's reflected in the carefully judged vagueness of such commitments as has been made already. Um, they're notable for their lack of clarity. Um, and so I think the answer is nothing will happen. I hope David's wrong. Um, in the event of a no vote, I, I hope that uh, there will be, particularly if it's a very close no vote, I, I hope that attention will be focused on the next round of uh, devolution, particularly fiscal devolution. Uh, I think that may be associated with a call for following up on the needs assessment front. Uh, you talked about revising the Barnet formula. I think the pressure will come from Wales and elsewhere for reconsideration of the way the, the, that formula works in the context of a needs assessment study. And Gavin McCrone has talked to you about that. It's, needs assessment is very complicated. I, I got involved in a, a, a bit of a mock one when at the Scottish office, and I think I learned from that that I could probably have come out with whatever conclusion people wanted uh, from the analysis. But I think it would be potentially on the table to do that, because there is a view that 
Scotland has done relatively well and Wales has done relatively badly and in the context of a no vote and the thought of further devolution, I think that might come to the fore. Um, in terms of what I would seek to devolve, I actually believe that transferring responsibility for significant further parts of welfare would give real opportunities to make decisions within Scotland. Um, I don't think devolving further income tax would lead to major changes. Uh, I do believe that if there was more ability for the Scottish Government to make its own decision across a wide range of welfare policies, and again Gavin touched upon this in his evidence and gave fairly clear indications of where that could go, that might give an opportunity for Scotland to develop its own priorities and to implement policies within that context. Assuming the resources were devolved with them, because when council yes. tax benefit was devolved, it was Absolutely. reduced by 10 per cent, 40 million a year. No, I, you're entirely right. The same way. It would have to be the full resource, a full appropriate resource would have to be transferred, and that would have to be very carefully scrutinised to make sure that that sum was forthcoming. Okay, now I'm going to finish the session by just asking either of our two guests who have been tremendous in answering all our questions this morning if they have any further points they wish to make. Well, they're happy. Yeah. I'm done. Time, perhaps. I'm done, sir. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you uh, very much for that. Just, just before I end the session, it's just to say that uh, for three long years, my loyal, nay, devoted uh, Deputy Convener has uh, been champing at the bit to uh, chair the Finance Committee, and next week he will have that. Uh, opportunity. So on that very positive note, I'd like to wind up the session. Thank you, Thank you very much, everyone.